These new age of Republican conservative grifters, individuals who are not real conservatives, who don't care about policy, who don't care about the people. What they care about uh, is denouncing black people in order to make white conservatives comfortable and then for them to be able to make money off of, such as Candace Owens. Chris couldn't stand Candace Owens. We often talked about her and talked about how awful she was and how she was frankly illiterate to the issues and doesn't really give a damn about black folks. Now, she's recently, of course, you know, she got fired from the Daily Wire. They, she claimed parting of ways. No, you got fired. And, oh, she's been on various platforms. Oh, going here. And uh, she accepts the invitation from the Joe Button podcast. And then she goes on the Breakfast Club and she's talking to them. And, and then she's talking about how, you know, oh, I mean, how, you know, this must be my, my second or third invitation and, and how I never got invited uh, to, uh, to these black platforms to, to talk about the things. Well, that's actually a lie. Um, she was, and I, I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But uh, the reason all of this is important, the reason this is important, uh, is because what you see is you see Candace desperately trying to, um, let's just say, um, come back to the neighborhood. You know, that person uh, who you grew up with and then they leave uh, and then all of a sudden you never see them again and then they don't come back uh, to any of the family events. They don't come back to the high school reunion. They don't come back to the church anniversary. Then all of a sudden they want to then uh, pop on back into our lives and go, oh, no, no, no. I was loving y'all uh, the entire time, even though the entire time what they were doing was uh, trashing us and distancing themselves from us. And it's not like we actually care in terms of uh, what uh, she had to say. But the thing that was going on was Candace Owens was consistently and constantly denigrating black folks for the amusement of white conservatives. Uh, I really didn't care about her interview on Joe Button's podcast or The Breakfast Club. Nothing against Joe, nothing against Envy or Charlemagne or Justin Hilarious. I just didn't give a damn about Candace because she's not bright. She's not the brightest bulb in the dark room. Until she posted this. A number of other people were ripping her to shreds. And again, I didn't care. But then I saw this and I said, I felt like that Al Pacino character in The Godfather 3. Every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. And so Candace posted this. The most brutal smears I ever faced was the media's attempt to convince black people, my own community, that I hated them. Finally, black America is recognizing that they were intentionally misled. Hmm, that's interesting. That is, th that is thanks in large part, to the Breakfast Club interview and Joe Budden. Hmm. Interesting. It's the media. It's the media. They're the ones who did that. That wasn't me. That was the media. You know what? I heard that media thing before. Y'all remember this? It ain't us, it's the media. It ain't us, it's the media. The me see, but see, it's that part right there. It's the media, it's the media. That was Candace Owens, the media. The media did all of that. The media was saying that I didn't like black people. It's the media's fault that I was being portrayed this way. And, and, and now if I could just go talk to black media, black targeted media and black owned media, and then now people can have a whole different view. And, and, and some Negroes out there, I've seen some of the comments like, oh my God, I mean, you know, I, I kind of agree with her. And you know, now I got a different view of her. Hmm, it was the media, okay? So Candace, was this the media when you appeared before Congress and talked about white nationalism? I said that in my 
opening, and I will say it again, you know that white supremacy and white nationalism is nowhere near, ranks nowhere near the top of the issues that are facing black America. And the reason that you are bringing them up in this room is because it is attempt to make the election all about race as the Democrats Not in do. my case, Ms. Owens, I'm sorry, don't, please my, do not characterize Ms. my motive. Ms. Mr. Chairman, it's my time. Yeah, you, it's my got, time. You've got your time, Mr. Meadows, I'll give you three more seconds. May, Every four years, you bring up race, and you knew exactly what I meant when I said hilarious, and you just tried to do live what the media does all the time to Republicans, to our president, and to conservatives, which you tried to manipulate what I said to fit your narrative, okay? I was not referring to the subject matter that is hilarious. I said it's hilarious that we are sitting in this room today, and I've got two doctors and a missus, and nobody can give us real numbers that we can respond to so we can assess how big of a threat this is, because you know that it is not as big of a threat as you are trying to make it out to be so that you can manipulate. Y'all heard that again. It the media, okay? Was this the media? But the real truth of the reason why people hate the queen has nothing to do with the colonization, has nothing to do, which by the way, just to be clear, um, the Brits invading Africa actually represents, and this is going to get me in trouble, mm. but it was, if you look at how forward it brought the African colonies, it ended up being a net positive. Now, this is, of course, people, it's going to get me in trouble because people somehow think that Africans were living happily ever after and things were great. And then horrible English, British descended upon and murdered everybody. And the French suddenly murdered everybody. And that just isn't the truth. Obviously, the African nations had slavery, just like um, uh, the European geez. nations had slavery. Wow. So it's an evil mm. that was not started, did not begin in Europe, actually can actually uh, be traced back to Muslim origin. Hmm. That's you talking. But it's the media. Was it the media when you talked to C at uh, CPAC, uh, that racist conference in 2019? First and foremost, stop selling us our own oppression. Stop taking away our self-confidence by telling us that we can't because of racism, because of slavery. I've never been a slave in this country. Stop telling us that we need to be obsessing over our past when we should be obsessing over our future and the potential that we have. That was, mm, mm, that was, uh, that was Candace talking at CPAC. Mm -hmm, that's right. That was her. Huh. How about this? Is this the media? You blame it. It's the media's fault when you own Dr. Phil. Policies are harmful also to the people that they purport to help. Um, and we have all of the evidence there to look at. Uh, when you artificially place a black American into a school in which they do not belong based on their knowledge, it doesn't mean that they go on to get A's. In fact, there was a black adjunct professor, you guys have definitely heard of him, Dr. Thomas Sowell, uh, who was teaching at Cornell University and he found that the majority of the black American students that were there were on academic probation. Now, these students were some of the smartest in the nation, but because they were artificially placed amongst their peers at Cornell University, they were failing on academic probation. These policies have never helped black Americans. It's just basically policies that are put in place to make people feel good, right? I feel like I'm doing something when in fact I'm actually creating harm. You either know the answers or you don't. Hmm, that coming from a college dropout. More of her on Dr. Bill. Uh, you're, they're you're only here for the could financial. Be. I'm giving you actual facts. No, right? I'm giving so you can, actual facts based on extensive research. Well, maybe they just don't feel done. good, um, but that's not the case. I mean, I went, I went to university. I did not feel good, right? I, I didn't pull the best grades in high school. Probably got into a better university than I should have gotten into based on my performance in high school. It wasn't because of my feelings. It's because I wasn't focused on it. And that we're talking about a cultural problem. What's going on back at home, as was in my circumstance. And none of that is because of institutionalized policy. Um, it almost seems like you guys refuse to accept that you know, black students aren't performing well, you feel like you have to have this burden of responsibility when in fact, if you actually wanted to help, you would look at the facts, re-examine the fact that it's not helping anybody, it's not helping black Americans to artificially place them into universities and you'd make effective change. But you're making the assumption that black students are academically inferior and they're not. No, they're you some are of our actually, most like, that's, brilliant that's what, that's students the, that's that we the have. Basic, no, 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 that you are making the assumption that they are inferior. You just said that they don't belong policies there. <laughs> I'm talking about the students that are based on the policies that you are defending right now, saying that we should have these policies that let them into these universities, not based on their skill set, but based on the color of their skin. So you are assuming that they are inferior. Hmm. Again, she blames the media. It's the media's fault 
uh, of all the things that I've said about black people that's actually pissed off black people and that's caused uh, white conservatives to be her biggest cheerleaders. Next. You know, social, you know that, and no, you know that our community, that, after the first socialist. 100 years, doctor, doctor, come that's on, the 100 socialist. years after slavery, the black community was doing better. We were going up, up, up. Then suddenly they socialized our community via welfare policies, and the black community started going down, down, down. And you're sitting here no. supporting a candidate that is advocating for making that on a larger scale. He's saying, we're not just going to do it to the black community, we're going to do it to every community in America. Well, you know his policies do not work. Hmm, again, it's all the media, the media. Here's Candace on the media. Fox News again. Well, I think it drew attention for a lot of reasons. I think in many ways, people on the right felt vindicated. And I know that there were a lot of moderate people that came over and realized that what I was talking about were actually real issues in black America. I touched upon the illiteracy rates. 75% of black boys in California not being able to read is a problem in black America. White nationalism, when black on black crime, 90.1% of all homicides against black Americans are performed by other black Americans. The entire hearing, in my opinion, opinion was a hoax. The continued hoax on black America, which comes to us from Democrats who want us ultimately to fail by focusing on something that is not harming us when you look at all of the other issues that we are facing. Oh, it's the media. That's why black folks were ticked off at me. Hmm. So when you sat down four years ago with the folks at Mike, that's the media, right? You often talk a lot about how liberals are quick to cry racism or oppression. How do you define racism? That's a, that's a... Or what's an example of something you find racist? That's a racist? big question. Um, I, I think Jim Crow laws were racist. Mm -hmm. That was racist. There can, and in the modern context? In the modern context, I, I can't think of a, a policy that is racist, but um, if, so, you know, if, if somebody walks into this room right now mm -hmm. um, and calls me the N-word, mm -hmm. that that's a racist term. Mm -hmm. In modern times, I can't think of a policy that is racist. You mean like when you sued your school and you called upon the NAACP to help you? and you got a settlement from your discrimination suit? Is that modern enough? Please continue. You pride yourself on being a free thinker. Correct. What's an area where you break from or differ from President Trump? Where are you a free thinker as it pertains tons to his, his agenda? There are Name tons of you. things that I've disagreed with President Trump what on. I thought that he responded too quickly to Syria. What are some others? Uh, you can give me some policies, and I can, I can, I can tell. Anything you yes or specifically no. on the areas that you you speak black about? Black America, which no. Is about race, about black Americans, no, no. about social policy, no, social I'm, issues. I'm fully on board with him, and fully that's why I'm. Yeah, that's why I, I go around and I speak positively about him, and I want people to understand that we should be trying something different, and Trump is offering something different. I'm fully on board with everything Donald Trump has said or done about black people including Charlottesville, including calling African nations shithole countries, including the denigration on a consistent basis of black women, even black women who work for him like Omarosa, the constant and the vicious attacks on black female reporters at the White House, the vicious attacks on black women in Congress. So you agree with all of that, right, Candace? but it's the media, they're the reason why. Next. Right, you know, in many ways, she is a victim of the culture, and I've said this over and over, a time, over, and over again ad nauseum, which is just that uh, victimhood has become almost a mental plague upon black America in particular, because that word racism is being so overused that society is becoming desensitized to it, and we actually can't even recognize it when it actually exists. We think everything is racist. Things that used to be normal conflicts between human beings, getting cut off while you're driving, having a bad correspondence in a grocery store, used to just brush it off 
off, shrug it off, and move on with your day. Now people are, are crying and making videos and pleading on Facebook to say, look what I experienced today. I mean, it, it's sad for her, but I think it also says, as you mentioned earlier, it's something bigger that's happening in culture that needs to be addressed before it goes too far. Brush it off, shrug it off. Black people have the cops called on them because they're barbecuing in the park. Black people get accosted by Karens just trying to deliver packages. A little black girl just selling lemonade gets accosted. Black man who's in the street, cars barely in the walkway, gets viciously attacked, saying she's gonna call the cops. But Candace says, those things are not racist. Just shrug, brush it off, shrug it off. Hmm, next. But can I ask a question? Can you insult a black person? Can you insult a black person without being a racist? That's just a question. I that think I have. the minute that he went with lazy, he was using. Why are you, why, saying, are you that? saying black people are lazy? No, but that's why does the word lazy trope. make you think that is a about common racist? No, it is not. I've actually I've never it been is. called lazy in my entire why life. So the question is, why does the word why lazy, lazy make? No, no, no. I'm asking you a question. I asked you a question. You said that lazy makes you think of black people. That's what you're saying. That is a common racist trope. So that's that's within you, not that within him. That is not a common racist trope towards black people. And it's incredible that you're defending a man who looks at a pregnant woman. I think he's a jerk. No, no, no. I think he's an absolute jerk. That is so disgusting. You're trying to be insulting because you're trying to move the ball because you just accidentally called black people lazy. That's what really happened. I know what you're. It's a typical racist trope. Okay, it's not a racist trope. Lazy, lazy is a word that means that you're not doing all the time. We gotta stop. Hmm. Interesting. Go to my, uh, first of all, here's what Candace Owens had to say about Ahmaud Arbery. Ahmaud Arbery was caught on camera breaking into an unfinished property that was owned by Larry English. His mother has confirmed it is him in the video. Please stop with the just a jogger bullshit narrative. Avid joggers don't wear khaki shorts and stop to break into homes. Hmm. Black man gunned down by racist in Georgia. Those racist were actually convicted of that, but she sides with the racists. Hmm. Here's her criticizing LeBron James when he spoke on the issue. Lasted to King James, who will never be what Kobe and Jordan were off the court because he lacks intellect. That's interesting considering he owns numerous businesses and actually, um, anyway. Bro, you have multiple homes, white personal chefs, gardeners, and housekeepers. If, if that's an example of literally being hunted by white people, then sign me up ASAP. Hmm. That's what she said. Yep. Oh, she added. Black America when nine-year-old Tyshawn Lee is lured from a basketball court down an alleyway and shot dead by a black gang member Crickets, which is a lie. Black America, when a repeat burglar is shot dead after breaking into a home, racism, injustice, protest, our culture is a joke. No, actually, the joke's on you, Candace. But, but I just want y'all to understand. See, I, I'm, I'm putting it in perspective because these are all things that Candace Owens has said, either on television um, or on social media about black people. But... She wants us to now, you know, excuse all those things because, you know, hey, it was the media. They did those things. That wasn't me. It's the media that actually kept me from my people. It's, it's the media that framed this and made it seem like I didn't like black people. It's the media who wasn't telling the truth about those things. It's the media, huh? Y'all know that, it's always the media. Here's Candace Owens in her own words regarding Juneteenth. Juneteenth is so lame, Democrats really need to stop trying to repackage segregation. I'll be celebrating July 4th and July 4th only. I'm American. I'm a Texan. Juneteenth is the creation of black people. Freed slaves of African descent. They're the ones who created Juneteenth. For those of us in Texas, we understand Juneteenth. We understand 
what Juneteenth means. We understand the importance of Juneteenth. We understand that Juneteenth was about freedom. But you know, you Candace Owens of the world, she also called Juneteenth ghetto. That's what she said. But she wants us now to excuse all these things that she has said. It's the media. It's their fault why my black people, my black people, my dear beloved black community doesn't like me because it's the media. Hmm. Check this out right here, y'all. One more video. Come on. Well, also, we have breaking news. Candace just uh, gave us this news. Sorry, I forgot. You were blocked tonight. Speaking of maybe AOC thought you disrespected her. You disrespected AOC? Yes, I How got do you blocked. dare do that? You it's can't really do sad. that. Yes, I, mean, I, I called her an intellectual coward because she says a lot of things and she throws a lot of insults, and yet she will not debate anybody. She doesn't want to debate people on the opposite side of the aisle. And I think that if you actually believe what you believe, you would be happy to sit down and have a discussion and a dialogue with somebody to get to the core of whose ideas are better. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that she believes anything that she says beyond getting clicks and getting retweets. I believe so she believes. I, I I disagree. I think I, she believes I don't, it. because why not just show up and have a debate? Well, maybe why she's not, not debate someone? I find that last one right there to be very interesting. Because she said, why not show to debate? Now, she was expressing her viewpoints because AOC blocked her. And she was how dare she? Why not debate? Why, why, why block somebody who disagrees with you? I find that to be really interesting. Really interesting. Guess who has blocked me on Twitter? Candace Owens. So you're complaining about AOC blocking you and you're saying, oh, why not have a debate and, 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 and why run from it? But that's what you do. Well, let me tell y'all something that went down. 2018, they had the little Blexit conference, little Blexit conference. And so they were um, meeting. And so we decided to say, you know what, we're going to attend your conference. Here's the email. Media instructions for the Young Black Leadership Summit 2018. Me, I'm on the email, my then booker, Jackie. Uh, and so we get the email from them with the directions about going to the summit. We applied for media credentials. We did. You didn't think we did? Check this out, y'all. Andrew Colvett, who the, the, and, and the attorney Port USA, love this. Dear members of the media, on behalf of Turning Point USA, I want to thank you all for applying for a press pass to cover the inaugural Young Black Leadership Summit 2018, hosted by TP USA Director of Communications, Out Candace Owens, Director of Urban Engagement, Brandon Tatum, and Founder and Executive Director, Charlie Kirk. While we have communicated with most of you directly, if you're receiving this email, you have been approved to receive a press pass to cover the entirety of the events. We're looking forward to an amazing summit and are happy for all to be a part of it. You can pick up your media badge tonight, starting at 6 p.m. at the Hyatt Regency, Washington, in front of Columbia Ballroom, AB. We were like, wow, interesting. You see the schedule here, Donald Trump, he was going to speak and had the media check in and they had all this sort of stuff, special event. Uh, OK, they had the White House and this is how you can register and all this sort of stuff and explaining to us the schedule and where things were taking place. And you see the guy, Andrew Colvett, vice president of strategic communications. Oh, my goodness. But then we got this email. Oh, I have to apologize. This email was sent to you in error. Unfortunately, your outlet's press pass request is not approved for this event. 
I apologize for the mistake. Completely my fault, best Andrew. Andrew wasn't your fault. The reality is Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk had the press pass canceled. They didn't want us to be there. But see, they couldn't control that White House event, you know, that the one they were touting, uh, the one taking place at the White House on October 26, 2018. Guess what happened, y'all? Rose showed up. And so here's what happened outside. Outside, after they had the events inside and I was jousting with a whole bunch of the black folks, I was debating like 10 at one time. It was like talking to children. It was very easy. So we go outside and Candace is out there and she's got on uh, this gray flannel outfit and coat hanging off her shoulders like she's Melania. And she's speaking on a bullhorn. And so I'm standing off to the side and I'm just watching this whole spectacle, y'all. Uh, and then all of a sudden she comes to do an interview. So she's probably about 15, 20 feet from me. And when she finishes the interview, y'all, she turns around and she sees me. And this is what happens. She was talking, then she goes, her eyes narrow and she's like burning and she goes, what are you doing here? I said, really? I said, I cover black events. Is this not a black event? This isn't the first time I've covered a black event at the White House. How dare you? You don't need to be. So then she starts just ranting and raving. I'm laughing. Then she tells me, I, that's right, you called me a coon. You called me an Uncle Tom, and that's why I blocked you. I said, Candace, you're a liar. I said, I don't even allow those terms to be used on my show or on my timeline. And I dare you to show me the tweet why I called you an Uncle Tom or called you a coon. And then one of her other little black minions, he comes by. He's like, yeah, we're going to show you. We got it. I said, oh, please, I'll bet you $1,000 you can't find it. And then she storms off in a huff with her coat off her shoulders, and she runs and walks off. Then little Charlie Kirk, his little racist ass, he comes up to me. Uh, and he goes, how you doing? I was like, how you doing? And he just looks at me. And I guess he was, you know, bothered because I didn't. I was like, who are you? He goes, Really? I said, yeah, dude, who are you? Oh, I'm Charlie Kirk. Oh, I said, y'all been, you've been running for me too. You want, I said, well, why won't y'all come on the show doing the debate? Uh, 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 I'm going to have to check with Can Candace. I said, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Don't she work for you? Why you got to check with her? It's supposed to be your organization. Neither one of them wanted to come debate. Now, why am I unpacking all of this? It's because Candace Owens has been fired from, t from she's no longer a turning point. No longer at PragerU, no, no longer at the Daily Wire. And so she's not, you know, out there wearing jacked up hairstyles with no, with no proper edge up. So, uh, so she's sitting here now trying to reintroduce herself into black America. She now wants to have dialogue with black America. And let me be real clear. I'm not questioning her blackness. I'm not saying that she's not black. What I am saying is you're not welcome to the cookout. You're not welcome to any of our events. You're not welcome to any of our conferences. Because see, when you choose to be a self-hating black person, and then you want us to then listen to you, no, 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 no. That's not how these things work. Because see, what you are desperate for, you are now desperate for a platform and you think that, oh, I can just, let me just say, you know, the, the things that I, I want to say, let me just say these, no, 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 that's not how these things work. Because see, Candace, you have trashed black people. You have denigrated black people. You have called us victims. You have danced before white conservatives and you enjoyed your time on that stage, vilifying black people, trashing black people left and right. And now you actually want to come back and have conversations with black people. And you, you want us to accept that. You want us to forget 
all of the things that you said. See, we can't do that, y'all. We, we can't forget all the stuff that you said. Sort of reminds me of that Elmer Fudd sounding fool, Jesse Lee Peterson. He has said some of the most vile, despicable things about black people you've ever heard in your life. So remember when I did that podcast, uh, PBD, Patrick uh, Bet David, called himself an independent who's a conservative? No. So it checks out. So we got this email here. Hello, Tony. I just left you a voicemail. My name's Tony Naimi, a talent booker for the PBD broadcast. They wanted me to, uh, they wanted to send an invite to me to be on their podcast with Jesse Lee Peterson. As you know from Roland's previous appearance on the show, PDB is a fair and balanced host who respects his guests, views, and missions. Um, he ain't fair and balanced, especially if you saw my post where he couldn't even, the first time I was on there. Please let me know what we can do to get this arranged. I look forward to your reply. Oh, I replied. Because see, normally, you know, when you have these, you know, com these things, people just sort of say, no, I'll pass. I couldn't do that. I said this, Tanya passed on your email to me. Let me be blunt as possible. I will never appear with Jesse Lee Peterson as the song by Bishop Bullwinkle, Hail to the No No. He is one of the dumbest, ignorant, and uninformed individuals I've ever met. I've encountered him before. He kills brain cells. He's even beneath Jason Whitlock, and that is hard to do. I've turned down doing his show directly. Jesse Lee Peterson is a grifting real Elmer Fudd. That means he is beneath me in every intellectual category, and I can't even believe PBD would even ask me to appear with that dumbass. So I had extended an invite six years ago when Candace was running her mouth, her and Charlie Kirk. I have no desire to talk to Candace Owens. There will not be an invite extended to Candace Owens. Because Candace, you said all you need to say about black people. We heard you loud and clear. You can now try to blame the media. You can now try to say, well, my words were twisted. But the reality is you said it. It came out of your mouth. And so you can, by all means, you can keep your unseasoned chicken. By all means, you can keep your jacked up edges. By all means, Candace. You can have your potato salad with raisins in it. By all means, you can have your pumpkin pie instead of sweet potato pie. By all means, you can stay exactly where you are in Nashville with your husband, and you can sit here and keep spouting off the nonsense that you always say. But what you will not do is come on this show and show your face and bring your weak, tired, incoherent, nonsensical, trifling comments that have dismissed, denigrated, and degraded black people for the last several years. I hope you made a lot of money doing what you did. I hope that the show that you were engaged in was quite successful for you. But what will not happen is if you're going to come on here and use this show and use this audience as an effort to, re to rehabilitate your trash image. Run along, Candace. You made it clear you didn't care for black people. You made it clear who you were comfortable with. So by all means, stay with them because we have absolutely no use for you in our pursuit to end inequality and to fight for justice and for righteousness when it comes to people of African descent in this country. All skin folk ain't kin folk, and you absolutely will be rejected at any cookout. Rebecca, you, you get to go first. <laughs> I mean, Roland, you, you said it all. And, and, and here's the thing. The issue is, I don't care if white media told me to hate Candace, whatever. But the issue is, like you said, is that Candace hates herself. 
And that's my problem with Candace Owens. It's because she hated herself so much, she happily decided to be a minstrel. And when I think about back to the 19th century, what actual minstrel shows were, it was white people showing up in blackface to make fun of black people to white audiences. So the level of self-hate to be a black person, to, to volunteer to show up as a minstrel to white audiences, to make fun of black community, and then now to try to come back into community, you know, that, that's, that's a deep psychological issue, and that makes her unsafe to Black America. And I, I think that's what many people don't understand when we say she is dangerous to Black America. She is not safe. She has demonstrated that she will sell us out, and we don't need any more sellouts. We need people to step in and continue to build our communities, not show up to hostile environments that don't like our communities, and stand with them to make fun of us us in the situations that we're in. And she's right, we're not victims. But what's unfortunate is that Candace is a victim of her own making. There's a lot of people who think that what she says is very witty and she has a point. But something that I want to remind our audience is by it's simply being a contrarian does not equal intellectualism. Just because you say something counter to someone else doesn't make you right, doesn't make what you're saying factual. In fact, Candace argues and debates like a child. A child uses straw man tactics. Um, for example, if you tell your child, hey, it's time to go to bed, and your child turns around and says, I hate you, that's what a child does, and that's what Candace does. She's a one-trick pony when she's actually trying to debate issues because she does not have the intellectual depth. She does not have the historical knowledge. She does not have the fortitude to actually have real conversations about issues concerning and of the Black community in this country. Instead, she employs... Um, um, straw man tactics where she sets up a false or exaggerated argument and then she tries to counter the false or exaggerated argument that she sets up. So she is not even honest when she's having debates. When you look at her constant framing, like that Fox News clip where she tried to tell that brother there, like, oh no, you tried to call black people lazy. I have never been called lazy. When all of us know that the lazy trope has been a, a, a target towards black folks by racist white people in this country by saying that we are lazy. We all know the historical context of that. So for her to set up that straw pen argument to try to reframe, say, oh, no, well, you're the racist because you're calling black people lazy because you're saying black people are lazy. That's what you believe. That is a bunch of BS. That should be beneath Candace, but it's not because she is a minstrel. She doesn't even require the paint on her face to actually do real black face. And so one thing she needs to understand is that the very racists who put her on different platforms and wanted her to, um, to, wanted to use her as a tool of anti-blackness, they're tired of her. They are dismissing her because she is no longer of value to them. And that is a very cold place to be in, Candace. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I don't feel for you. I, I actually have empathy for you because the level of hatred of yourself that allowed you to sink that low. Um, Robert, as I said at the outset, the death of Chris Matchler, I know many black conservative, black Republicans, friends with them, Michael Steele, uh, of course, Alfonso Jackson, a former uh, HUD secretary. My man, Michael Williams, worked in the Reagan administration. I mean, I can go on. I mean, you know, my man, Bob Brown, of course, in the Nixon administration. I can go on and on and on. So I don't have any anger or resentment. I don't attack black Republicans. I know individuals who are real black Republicans, K. Cole James and others, who actually uh, do things for black people. But I know grifters like Candace Owens like uh, that fool, Officer Tatum, whatever his name is. I know when I see them and what you're not going to do, you're not going to use us as props in your redemptive tour after you attacked us mercilessly for the last uh, eight years. A, a couple of things. I 
think that we also can't lose the reason that Candace got law, uh, got fired from her job in the first place, which is she started talking about the Jewish community the same way she has been talking about the black community uh, and forgot that they, they actually are the people who signed her paycheck and she was summarily <laughs> shown the back door. Uh, you came to talk about everybody else crazy the same way you talk about your own people because you, you're only useful in talking about black folks to them. You are not useful criticizing uh, the Jewish community or Israel or anybody else and therefore she was given her walking papers. It's an important point to um, to make on that. Uh, but when we talked earlier about COINTELPRO, for the people who, do, uh, who aren't familiar, we're talking about counterintelligence programs uh, that the CIA and the uh, FBI used uh, throughout the civil rights movement to undermine black movements. So they would take somebody, let's say somebody who was in college, uh, but they were about to fail out. They filed a lawsuit against the school to try to get a settlement. They don't have a degree. They don't have any work experience. Um, they really don't have any justifiable reason for anybody to listen to them, and then they prop them up. They turn them into a voice for that community. Uh, they put them in front of people. They put them on cable news. They uh, put them on uh, speaking tours. They bring them to the White House. They make them the spokesperson for the president when it comes to black issues. That's what they would do if it was a COINTELPRO program. Uh, they would take an individual like that. Again, no education, no work experience, uh, no justifiable reason to have a conversation with them on these issues at all, no level of expertise, and they will give them just directly those talking points for them to recite back uh, back in public uh, as actors. Remember, Ronald Reagan was an actor. Nancy Reagan was an actor, well-known on the Hollywood uh, lots back in the old days. And so when someone like uh, Candace Owens shows up, you have to understand how to, uh, how to uh, specifically point out and understand COINTELPRO when you see it. That's a, just a voice that is created out of nowhere that is a, a thing that young people, Gen Z now, they call them industry plants. They just show up out of nowhere, suddenly they're put into the limelight, put into the forefront, given a voice, and the only thing they have to uh, say are things to tear down and destroy the black community. Candace Owens is no different than Sexy Red or Ice Spice. There's a creation out of nowhere, no known talent, no known ability uh, to actually produce anything uh, positive to the black community. Their only use is for the majority culture to destroy black communities, and that's all they are, the modern version of COINTELPRO industry plants that are used to tear down black communities. Uh, Julian, um, during the, uh, when, when Mike Pence was uh, there in the White House, the, there was an event at the White House, uh, and uh, at that particular event, he was meeting with some black Republicans, some black conservatives. And um, at the meeting, K. Cole James, who then was heading the Heritage Foundation, she was invited there. Uh, also, uh, Elroy Saylor, who was former chief of staff for um, um, Congressman J.C. Watts, was there. There were some other people who were there as well. Um, and at the insistence of um, somebody, uh, Trump or somebody else, at, the, at their insistence, uh, they insisted that Candace Owens be invited. Now, she was not on Pence's list, he did not invite her. Uh, I was told Pence was not happy at all that he uh, had to entertain her. Uh, and I, I'm trying to find it, uh, but uh, there was a photo that was taken and Candace's ass was cropped out of the photo. And Pence, thank those who were there, did not mention her at all. Well, something happened during the meeting and, and Candace, again, at, not a lightweight. I mean, not a, not, not a, not a featherweight, a flyweight. And so she descends, she starts, and I, I was told this uh, by one of the participants, she starts just walk, 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 walk. And K. Cole James, K. Cole James, who is well known in black conservative circles, uh, K. Cole James, again, who was the first black leader of, of the Heritage Foundation, K. Cole James, and if any of y'all want to see, I actually did an interview. So again, this is a perfect example when people say uh, that I don't, I don't talk to black conservatives. Actually, I do. I sat down, did an interview with K. Cole James in her office, uh, and we talked about uh, uh, her leadership there. And so what was interesting is uh, Candace begins her little, well, you know, her little, um, uh, little line uh, trying to diss black people. And ooh, all of a sudden, the auntie in K. Cole James comes out, Julian, in the meeting. The auntie comes out in the meeting. And I was told, she said, little girl, you don't know what you're talking about. And then began to scold her. And then began to teach her. Began to break 
her down about the subject matter at hand and thoroughly embarrassed her in front of the vice president of the United States. She had to, te she had to teach her a little lesson. Because, see, even the black conservatives knew. Look, girl, you ain't got no business being in this room because you have no credentials, no resume, no experience, no knowledge, no depth. Because truth is, Candace Owens is as deep as mustard on a hot dog. Julian. <laughs> well, you know, you have impeccably laid out your case uh, with the clips. Uh, Rebecca has impeccably talked about um, the menstrually that is part of what this woman's uh, DNA is. I just, frankly, Roland, loving you in this program as I do, wonder why we would waste so much time on such a nitwit. Um, because that's what she is. She's a nitwit. She's a lightweight. She has no credentials. And she's a liar. I mean, a, 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 beyond all that, she is a liar. I mean, to we could completely debunk her if she's trying to have some comeback tour. But I don't know where she could come back to. Look at that. I mean, seriously, look at that. First of all, comb your hair before you go on television. You know, that's number one, um, part of the black girl code. But it's, it's more than that. I mean, she looks bad, but she talks bad. The particular clip that I, I was um, most incensed by is when she said, we have made more progress uh, after, after slavery than we have now. She ignores the entirety of the history that I'm researching now for my book about lynching the lynching culture, the wealth gap, and reparations. She ignores the fact that we might have had more had there not been laws put into place to prevent us from accumulating, laws put into place to um, prevent us from going to school. We, the laws that have allowed our HBCUs to be underfunded for so long, laws deliberate. This is not like casual, oh, it's not our fault, racism. These are laws that were deliberately passed. The only two people who or two groups of people who were excluded from minimum wage laws were domestic workers, who was that? Black women and farmers. Domestic workers excluded, uh, which meant that white women, as you, white women, could give you whatever as, as your pay. Take some food home, why don't you? Here's some old, old clothes. Ignoring all of that humiliating history, not to mention the economic lynchings that took place. Mm -hmm. when we accumulated, when we accumulated, Many were lynched. I think of the story of Isidore Duncan, wealthy black man in Arkansas, had money in his pocket to go pay his workers. He was so wealthy, he had sharecroppers. They found his body chained to a tree and lit on fire. Found him three days later. And there's stories like this, like, you know, you hear, you hear me all the time. I can tell these stories. I had to be Wells' three friends. Yep. Started four to compete with the white man. They were lynched. Economic lynching. She has, this girl has no knowledge. She dropped out of college, but one would think she dropped out of high school, which, by the way, she earned $37,000 for suing her high school district right. because she received racist phone calls. But there's no racism, girl? Please. Well, what do they say? Bye, Felicia, something like that? And that, that just, just disappear. Candace, the friendly ghost, go away. So, again, if any others out there, y'all in black-owned, black-targeted media, y'all going to have all the conversations you want but she will not be darkening this doorway and walking into this black owned media studio because I don't have time to talk to flyweights. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media and investment. This next generation social app has already raised $10 million and has just opened a new round to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. He stoked racial violence, attacked voting rights, and if reelected, vowed to be a dictator and, quote, get revenge. We can't go back. As president, I put money in pockets, creating millions of new jobs, and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this. Oh, if your name is Emmanuel Acho, 
a, bat, a piece of your ass has been uh, chewed up and spit out. Folk, they've been lighting this Fox Sports brother up after he made these comments following Angel Reese's news conference after they lost to Iowa. I'm sure y'all heard it. Press play. I'm about to give a gender neutral, racially indifferent take. Now, if you want to say, well, Acho, cater your take based upon gender, Acho, cater your take based upon race, I will understand that. But I'm about to give a gender neutral, racially indifferent take. Angel Reese, you can't beat a big, big bad wolf, but mm. then kind of cry like Courage the Cowardly Dog. Mm. Because if you want to act grown, which she has, if you want to get paid like you grown, which you are, if you want to talk to grown folks like you grown, which you did post game when you told a coach for an opposing team, watch your mouth. If you want to tell people, get your money up, then post game when you take an L, you just got to take it on the chin. Nobody mourns when the villain catches an L. And Angel Reese, you have self-proclaimed to be the villain. Shout out to you because you were the second best basketball player on the court and it was not close. Outside of Caitlin Clark, it was you. 17 and 20, dog, showed up, biggest game, second biggest game of your career, absolute dog, but you can't under any circumstance go to the podium and now try to ask for individuals to give you sympathy. No one has sympathy for the villain. Mm -hmm. You painted the bullseye on your back. Why are you surprised when people shoot at you? Mm -hmm. So if you want to act grown, if you want to pose grown, if you want to talk grown, if you want to talk to grown folks grown, then you got to take the L like you grown. Because what frustrated me is when you want to be the villain, but you want to hope for sympathy like a hero. I'm about to give a gender neutral, racially and So, um, that was the commentary. Now, keep in mind, y'all, keep in mind that at the news conference after they lost to Iowa, somebody, a reporter, asked Angel Reese a question about the last year since LSU won the national championship. This is what she was talking about. I don't really get to stand up for myself. I mean, I have great teammates. I have a great support system. I got my hometown. I got my family that stands up for me. I don't really get to speak out on things just because I just try to ignore and I just try to stand strong. like. I've been through so much. I've seen so much. I've been attacked so many times. Death threats, I've been sexualized. I've been threatened. I've been so many things and I've stood strong every single time. And I just try to stand strong for my teammates because I don't want them to see me down and like not be there for them. So I just want to always just know like I'm still a human. Like, all this has happened since I won the national championship. And I said the other day, I haven't had peace since then. And it sucks, and, but I still wouldn't change. I wouldn't change anything. And I would still sit here and say, like, I'm unapologetically me. I'm going to always leave that mark and be who I am and stand on that. And hopefully the little girls that look up to me, and hopefully I give them some type of inspiration that, you know, hopefully it's not this hard and all the things that come at you. but. Keep being who you are. Keep waking up every day. Keep mo being motivated. Staying who you are. Staying ten toes. Don't back down. And just be confident. I don't really get to stand up. That was what she was talking about. Well, uh, in the past few few hours, let's just say uh, Acho got a info and. Um, this was today's video. I just want to say a quick thank you um, to everyone who has respectfully uh, reprimanded me and uh, offered brilliant opinions on the Angel Reese conversation. I do not believe there is any one way to think about things, but thank you to the Ryan Clarks, the Essence Atkinses, the Bozema St. John's, um, the Trellas, the, the different individuals who is publicly and privately, um, just giving me good wisdom, good feedback, uh, good, good discernment. Um, I understand. I understand. I understand. I think life is all about understanding. 
And so I just want to applaud those publicly, you watching, and those privately who have respectfully, the operative word there being respectfully, who have respectfully reprimanded me. Matt Barnes, incredibly, incredibly, incredibly wise words. Um, so I thank all of you all for that. I do not stand on a hill saying that I am right and you are wrong. I simply stand on a place saying, hey, this is what I believe. What do you believe? Let's listen to one another and construct a collective belief. So love to everybody who's respectfully reprimanded me, and I appreciate it so, so, so very much. Thank you all for that. All right. So I just want to let you all know something. Um, Roland is not a body language expert, but y'all can go ahead and show it. Let me explain something to you. Um, come on, show it. When you're talking and you're rubbing your neck. <laughs> yeah, y'all need y'all need to give me a two shot. Y'all need to put a two shot. <laughs> See, when you talking like this here, and you uh you come on, need two box. See, when you when, when you when you doing this here, uh, and then you then you doing this here. You like, uh, I, 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 um, I appreciate y'all calling me. I, I appreciate y'all getting in my ass privately. I appreciate y'all, you know, let me know that my ignorant ass sounded like a damn fool. Um, I, 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 I really. Respectfully. <sighs> oh, ooh, ooh, is, is it? Is it warm in here? Am I the only one? Is it? That's really what you just saw right there. For everybody watching right now, let me go ahead and give the cussing disclaimer. Uh, that's about to ensue. Uh, cause I, I saw Reese earlier on Twitter. So, um, I'm, I'm, Lauren, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you. Let me go ahead and get, you know, cause you know, cause you also text me like, uh, are we gonna, Lauren was like, are we gonna deal with this tonight? <laughs> well, I'll say this. There's a lot to unpack a little bit here. I mean, I get what he was trying to say. I do get what he was trying to say. I do think I'm a big Angel Reese fan. I think she's fantastic, and it's great to see women's basketball like blow up in the ratings and everything else. Uh, but the uh, I think what people were probably really sensitive to was the terms gender neutral, as if um, you know there is no difference in criticism. I, you know, but you know, women women uh, athletes are coming into their own now, and I think people are now starting to have to make this adjustment. But after we saw the thing that happened in the L.A. Times, right? Uh, and then we hear Angel Reese tell us that she's been getting death threats for a year, which the first thing that I thought about was, wow, isn't that interesting that we can get a 40 minute, 10,000 word piece in the Washington Post about Kim Mulkey, but we can't get one piece in the Washington Post about Angel Reese getting death threats for a year. That to me is an extremely serious thing, you know, and it's kind of like taken as, oh, no big deal, whatever. And, you know, I think about that with a lot of folks that are in the news, Fannie Willis getting up on the stand, telling everybody she's been getting death threats and everybody acts like this is normal, you know, business as usual. And it's not. It really isn't. And you do at some point have to attribute some of that to the gender of the people who are saying it. It's like nobody cares. Uh, but I do get some of his point because I do think that you know, didn't the women's movement tell us that we were equal to men and we could do whatever we want? And then when we get out there and do it and we get criticized. Some of us get sensitive to that. So it's like if we're equal, we, we've got to be equal with the criticism. And frankly, the guys get criticized a lot. You know, Cam Newton, I can remember, Deion Sanders, you know, people who are black, who are very assertive out there, uh, particularly with sports, I think both men and women get criticized. I think it was just last week we saw a soccer player that plays for Brazil break down in tears because of the racism that he was dealing with. Right. And nobody talked about that. You but, didn't but, get the big outrage. You but, didn't but get here, the big thing that you get. But I mean, here's where oh. I, but here's where Acho screwed up. <laughs> no, no, okay. seriously. Where uh -huh. he's where he screwed up was 
is that he didn't understand context. What he did was he asserted that Angel Reese was crying because they lost. That's not what happened. She was literally asked a question. Also, let's factor this in. She announced a couple of days later she was declaring for the WNBA. Um, I can tell you, I remember having a conversation with someone on the bus coming back from our award ceremony in 1991 at the National Association of Black Journalists. And it was my last night as a national student representative. And I remember shedding tears. And I remember this sister was like, why are you emotional? Because what I did for two years and how much I invested and what it meant uh, to me personally. So he screwed up by getting the context wrong. Well, he, I, Acho should have shut his mouth, though, the minute that he heard that she was getting death threats for a year. Let's stop on that one for a second. But, but, no, but, that's, but that's my why, whole why point. Getting, so he, 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 any, that's my why point. Was getting any, 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 why was she getting checked after that and after what we saw with the L.A. Times? But, but, but that's my point. So he shut his mouth on that. So, just, so he got nailed. He got nailed. Yeah, he got. I mean, look, it, it wasn't like that, it wasn't like he she came in and was crying because they lost the game. But here's the deal: even if she cried after the loss, I've seen men. I've seen men cry after their last game. I've seen college players who go, "There's no tomorrow." I've seen I've seen guys cry on the court. You'll see them. You'll see them. They, they'll lift the jersey of their eyes because in that moment, they know that it's over and they may not be going to the NBA. And even if they go to the NBA, it doesn't matter. We saw the other night Steph Curry have on-court emotion when Draymond Green got kicked out of a game in the first four minutes. And here's the Golden State Warriors fighting for a last, that they're literally in the number 10 slot one game ahead of my Houston Rockets. In fact, they're playing right now. I just got the alert. And so Steph is sitting here going, dude, what are you doing? I'm 35 years old. I don't know how much longer I play. And Steph was emotional and where he kicked the chair and he put the jersey over his face. So, okay, the villain. So all of that, all of that, See that that's that why he sounded like a damn idiot. That villain thing, he sounded like a damn idiot on that villain thing because that's exactly what the dude at the L.A. Times did. I don't know why he wasn't paying any attention to that. But just to wrap it, I do think the point that, that he was trying to make about the gender-neutral criticism is that he's trying to say that the lady players should get criticized just like the men do or that if you're going to get out there and sort of be like the person who's always sort of asserting themselves in a certain way – you can expect some criticism. I think that's what he was trying to do. I don't know what, I, I, frankly, but, frankly, you know. I don't, frankly, okay, here's the deal. I don't know what the hell he was trying to do uh, because before I go to Reese, I don't know what the hell he was trying to say here when he was on Van Lathan's podcast <laughs> and he actually said this. <laughs> oh, when white people say, well, racism doesn't exist, I know why they say that because I've been in them rooms when they're saying that. When I kick it with black people and they're like, all white people are racist. Hmm. I know why you're saying that. All the while, I have the privilege and luxury of not having generational trauma because my parents were born in Nigeria. So, man, my method is oh, removing some of the sting um, because I don't have that sting and trying to deliver a message in a manner that people can receive it. Okay. Let me tell you why what you just said offends me. Okay. All right. You saying that you don't have generational trauma and you didn't mean it this way, but the reason, and, and it's, I have to name it, you saying that you don't have any generational trauma in some way meaning, or that in some way meaning that your delivery method to white people is going to be either more effective or more sanitized is to me dangerous. And let me tell you why. Everybody that you just named and what you're talking about does what they do in different ways. I don't think that any of the things that they do are necessarily harmful. 
But what I could say is a black man, a prominent one, acting as an emotional butler for white people and serving them the most milk toast, unspicy, unseasoned brand of racial discourse and accountability possible could definitely be harmful. Like we're fighting for our lives. And to me, having a conversation like that at that particular time, it's not that it's a different method. Everybody has a different method. Is that it's the wrong method. Is that it gives cover for Reese. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Is it my turn? Yes. <laughs> you know, I have to say, I, I thoroughly enjoyed, and somebody tagged me on that uh, apology video, his emphasis on respectful and respectfully <laughs> reprimanding him. And I have to say, fuck your respectful, because okay. I think that it is arrogant and ridiculous to expect, and this is a very normalized thing, that people expect deference to their feelings when they just shit it on a Black woman unprovoked. OK, here you have a young black woman who has been subjected to death threats, who had AI porn. OK, that's what she meant when she said sexualized because they made fake porn of her through AI. And she had to defend that and has been called a slave and all kind of racist insults. I mean, hell, let's throw Dr. Jill Biden there. She was going to invite the losing team because... She liked, you know, Caitlin Clark and, 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 and Angel Reese taunted her a little bit. Yeah, last year, no, last year. That was last year. But I'm saying you've had a person who is literally tearfully pleading for her humanity. That was not a sports conversation. That was a human being talking about her humanity and just asking for people to treat her like a human being. And he missed all of that shit because he saw a chance to dunk on, punch down, and shit on a Black woman who lost. A Black woman who came to prominence because she was a champion, because of her style, because of her confidence, because of her bravado. And here's the first time where you get to say, aha, bitch, and you took it. And you tried to play the whole gender neutral and racially indifferent thing. Well, that's bullshit because that's exactly why people have the hot takes that they do. There are a lot of people that have confidence, that do the trash talk. That makes it entertaining. That's part of the reason why you're seeing record ticker, se record ticker sales for women's basketball and for and, and ratings. And that's part of the reason why you have, for the first time this year, women's basketball being able to even use March Madness branding. So it's bullshit to try to sit up there and disregard that and to attach words I understand it's a cartoon character like Courage the Cowardly Dog because she showed emotion. Well, which one is it? You don't want her to be the biggest, baddest bitch who is, you know, who's leaning into, and mind you, as a defense mechanism, leaning into the villain role because they're going to paint her with that no matter what. Anytime a black woman opens up her mouth, she's a villain, period. So, okay, maybe she leaned into it. She makes someone off a good for her. I am mad at that. But that has nothing to do on court with what she was talking about in that interview. You don't hear Angel Reese out there, you know, having failing drug tests, fucking with people or anything like that. She has respect from her peers. Caitlin Clark, the darling of, of, of white America at basketball, has expressed respect for her. So how did he miss all of that shit? How did he miss the moment? How did he miss the message? It's because it was a black woman who had the audacity to be confident, who had the audacity to to affirm her own confidence and encourage other girls, not even the specifically black girls, but other girls who look up to her to maintain their steadfastness in being confident. And so I applaud her. That's not cowardly. That's actually courageous. And you can be a champion and you win some and you lose some. But at the end of the day, we need to move forward with humanity. So I was one of those people that disrespectfully reprimanded him. And I will rhetorically stomp a hole in your ass every time people feel comfortable coming for and shitting on black women for doing nothing more than having the audacity to be unapologetically confident and excellent, period. I have a feeling where Greg is going to go, but I'm going to hold this. No, you, sh you should say it. You uh, should say no, it. No, 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 no. I, 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 I got something queued up, but I have a oh. feeling Greg is going to go there instead. But Greg, go right ahead. I don't know. I mean, look, 
everybody. This is why we have to have the Black Star Network. We can't have this conversation in white spaces. Uh, brother uh, Samuel Lecho, Ebo brother, ask your mama and daddy about generational trauma. It's a little thing called the Biafran War in Nigeria. Ask your people, the Igbo people, because clearly you didn't learn it at home, and you damn sure didn't learn it at the University of Texas, Austin. That's probably why DEI is important. You should have took a black studies class there, or an African studies class. You know, Toy and Falola is the <laughs> University of, uh, uh, of Texas, Austin. He's an Igbo man. Uh, maybe you should ask your people about generational conflict when it comes to difference, because sometimes it can be black on black. Don't, don't get me started on that. So we can mm. kind of put him to the side. But the reason, you know, the man, he rubbing his neck and stuff, he don't want to lose his job because everybody's come for him. And I think that this is the issue. This is the issue. Now, I've been a fan of the women's game since, you know, my girlfriend was a forward at Tennessee State for the Tiger Gyms, which is part of the problem. You know, HBCU women's teams used to have their own identities. They weren't lady anything. Now these Negroes have forgotten their history. Now they're the lady Tiger is the lady whatever. No, no. Tiger Bells, Tiger Gyms, Tiger Sharks, Sharks. And that speaks to the point. I've never been a fan of slave master politics and slave and, and uh, plantation athletics. You know, I'm from Tennessee. I was in New Orleans over the weekend for the National Association of Black Social Workers. And they love those black. They love Flage. They love Angel Reese till they lose. And at that point, the N-word throws free, freely like the Mississippi. <laughs> the point is this. Uh, you know, a old girl, the coach, Kim Mulkey, she dodged a bullet. <clears throat> she dodged a bullet. The L.A. Times did her a favor. Because I read that full like like y'all did, the full article in the Washington Post. And, you know, nobody who, you know, uh, Du Bois and Black Reconstruction would have called her probably the poor white, you know, the striver. But I'm, I, you know, I lived in Philly for 17 years, so I remember when John Cheney threatened to kick John Calipari's ass when he was coaching at UMass. And that's when uh, Marcus Canby and boys was up there. And John Cheney, whose boys were always in class, who practiced at 6 a.m. so they could never have an excuse for missing class. You know, that Don Staley mentality, Don Staley coming out of Dobbins High School in North Philly. You know, I'm not sure that any of Don Staley's uh, girls would be uh, in, in Sports Illustrated swimsuit. But again, this I'm, I'm having a, a, a serious conversation here. I'm, going, I'm coming to this point. This isn't a critique of Angel Reese. I'm looking at the coaches. I'm looking at the mentality. I'm looking at the uses and abuses of black people. I'm looking at the race war that is athletics. Because, see, I'm a fan of the women's game. I'm sure we all remember Don Imus, ancient dead ass, when he called Vivian Stringer's young ladies the nappy-headed hoes on the Rutgers team. This was the race war between Rutgers, between uh, Pat Summit and them at UT. Who, and, you know, uh, if you read the Washington Post article, you know, Kim Mulkey worships Pat Summit. But then, so does Don Staley in many ways. But remember when the black women on the, the University of Tennessee team, and especially Rutgers team, was going up against the slave master in stores. That would be Gino, who always seems to find a couple of white girls to surround the sisters with. I'm sure for every uh, Maya Moore, you got a Paige Bucket, you got a Rebecca Lobo. In other words, you know, women's sports no different than men's sports in terms of race war. And what I'm saying is that anytime I see a person like Kim Mulkey, Got all these sisters down there in the bayou in a racist as hell, Louisiana State, Baton Rouge. And then you basically don't care what they do as long as they help you win a championship. Shout out, of course, to Kim Mulkey, who ain't say a damn thing when the sister who got her a national championship was locked up in Russia Brittany because Grant. she's mad as hell. They mad her about the national anthem. Trust. That's a woman who would have the day. I don't even want to see where she might have the tattoo play because I don't need to see anything on Kim Mulkey's body. But I'm saying she did not take those players off because of the national anthem. She MAGA as it gets in many ways. The point I'm trying to make is when you get to this, Samuel Acho is, is look, man, you're not even a sideshow in this. You're not even a sideshow in this. What you have is young people. And, you know, I got all the world room in the world for young people. But you got young people in a space where these coaches in a plantation system, if they're not black women coaching them, and I'm very serious about this, they will engender this sense of anything goes that will have a sister from West Baltimore trash talking to white girl because that's what she would do. And we all love it until it goes sideways. Were those tears because of the abuse? Absolutely. And you're right. She should. Look, the minute you hear death threat, all bets are off. At the same time, of course, you are crying in part because you lost, because there's all this emotion there, because you want to beat these white girls. 
and you want to keep going. But you know what? When the national championship is played, the only thing that I see flawed about Don Staley in South Carolina is that I wish there was one more word added to her title. Head coach, South Carolina State. I swear, I wish these black players would go play for black coaches at HBCUs because once you go to these white schools and you up on these plantation system people, it becomes race war and it's not gender. It's Shamika Holesclaw at UT and Candace Parker and them. It's, remember, UNLV under Tarkanian. Remember the U, University of Miami football team. In other words, it's always proxy waste war, and they love their Negroes until they lose. Samuel Acho, brother, you wandered out in the middle of a race war and caught a stray, and you need a little bit more history before you start saying you don't identify with generational trauma, because, son, you, what you don't know is a lot. So I knew Greg was going to go there a few months ago. Oh, okay, you few, did. No, 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 no I, I knew that because a few months ago, um, I actually came across this on Instagram. And you know what? Maybe Emmanuel Acho needs to watch this. The origin of Nigeria that shocked the hell out of me. Nigeria was never meant to be a country. It was something else entirely. In this video, I'm going to tell you what I discovered. Oh, and I want to acknowledge Burner Boy for bringing my attention to this in his song, Another Story, on his album, African Giants. Thank you for inspiring this video, and all of you let Burner Boy know that he got to me, and now I'm sharing this information with you. The creation of Nigeria was never about democracy, never about Christianity. It was about money, business, and profit. None of it for us. Pay attention. The area now known as Nigeria was called the Slave Coast up to 1870. This was the point at which the British had stopped slave trading and moved on to palm oil as their primary commodity out of Nigeria. One of the main suppliers of palm oil was the Benin Kingdom, and you have to watch my video on one of the greatest African kings most of you have never heard of. This is an important story for me personally because I'm from that region, so they are my people. And his fight with the British Empire over palm oil is one of the greatest stories of African colonial history. Anyway, everyone wanted palm oil and especially the British. A man called George Goldie set up the United African Company in 1879, which was then changed to the National African Company. He structured the palm oil business in the Niger Delta region, and by 1884, he had a monopoly that the British could exploit. So in 1886, Goldie violated the agreement he had made with the chiefs and moved his operations into River Niger and Benue. The company was also renamed to Royal Niger Company. Goldie tricked the chiefs into signing unfair trade deals, giving Goldie exclusive rights to export palm oil instead of what the chiefs thought would be free trade. These contracts were written in English, a language we didn't understand and based on laws that were not our own. This is similar to the land negotiations done with Native Americans in what is now known as the United States of America, where deals were done via contracts in English with laws that had nothing to do with the Native Americans. There was a meeting called the Berlin Conference in 1884 to 1885, set up by Germany's first chancellor, Otto van Bismarck. This was where colonial powers discussed how to carve up Africa and structure trade across the pieces of our continents they would take. We were not part of these conversations. The best way to think of this is like the NBA draft. Guys were out there making bids between lunch breaks and spa sessions. At this conference, the kingdom of Opobo was given to Britain. When King Jaja of Opobo tried to export his own palm oil, he was accused of obstructing commerce and then exiled. How crazy is that? And on his way home in 1891, he was poisoned with a cup of tea. Guys, I couldn't make this stuff up. The Jaja of Opobo story made other chiefs wary of their deals with the British. King Koko of Nembe Brass was one of them. He tried to take down the Royal Niger Company and attacked the company headquarters in Akasa by Elsa on January 29, 1895. King Koko captured 60 white men and lost 40 of his own soldiers. He used the 60 hostages to demand he be allowed free trade, the agreement he believed he had with the British company. They refused and he killed 40 of his hostages. The British Royal Navy retaliated by leveling the city of Brass completely on February 20th, 1895. King Koko went into exile and the British not only took control of the palm oil he once had, 
but also fined the people of his kingdom 500 pounds, as well as confiscating their weapons. Tragically, King Coco committed suicide in exile in 1898, after being branded an outlaw by the British company that had taken his kingdom palm oil and reputation. The Royal Niger Company sold its territory to the British government for 865,000 pounds in the late 1800s. This territory was known as Nigeria. In 1914, the Southern Protectorate and Northern Protectorate was combined by Lord Lugard. And like that, the Royal Niger Company was rebranded as a country which would gain independence on October 1st, 1960. And Lugard is a street in Nigeria that still exists today. The Royal Niger Company changed its name to the Niger Company Limited, and it was then acquired by Unilever. Unilever still operates in Nigeria to this day. And that, my brothers and sisters, is how Nigeria came to be. We have a long way to go to fix the country, but we won't ever have a hope and a solution to our problems if we don't know how they started. What I told you in this video is just a small part of the foundations that led to unrest, civil war, economic instability, and so forth. Remember, it's not about asking anyone else to fix this or even wasting time blaming those we know caused and perpetuated it. This is about knowing our history. Nigeria was never a country we created. It was a company designed by colonizers for profits and a lot of the infrastructure put in place for that siphoning of resources out of our land is still very much in place today. Crude oil simply replaced palm oil and soon lithium may replace crude oil. Honestly, I feel angry, not just for what happened to my ancestors, but for the fact that I wasn't taught about this in school in Nigeria and that our children are not being taught about these things now. Every Nigerian should know everything about who we are and what we are up against. Subscribe for commentary on Africa, history, current affairs, politics, and the diaspora. See, this right here, Manuel Acho, is why what you said was beyond stupid. For you to sit here and say that, oh, unlike you African Americans, unlike you Black Americans, those of you of people of Afri people who had uh, relatives who were enslaved of African descent, oh, I, I don't possess that generational trauma. So therefore, I can come here and I can talk to white people and I can talk to black people. No, your Nigerian ass has trauma. No question. Just like every other African who hailed from the continent where they were colonized. You literally represent a part of Africa where the country never even existed. That's right. But then you sit here and sit your ass on Fox Sports. They used to employ Jason Whitlock, and it's no surprise that Jason is on Twitter and he is sitting here uh, saying, oh, Emmanuel's correct and the rest of you are wrong. But see, this is the problem when you try to be one of the good ones. <laughs> See, this right. is the problem, Emmanuel, when you think that you somehow are set apart from the rest of us. When the fact of the matter is, you got lots of trauma coming out of the continent, and in fact, your trauma still persists. When you've got kidnappings of girls in Nigeria, when you've mm. got the United States, the reason we pay so much attention to Nigeria is because of your oil. But let's talk about the economics of the people in Nigeria. Look, I hope to visit one day. I'm told it's a beautiful country. I'm told that you have uh, exhibitions of significant wealth of those Africans who have money, those Nigerians there. But please, Emmanuel, don't you dare. And I was trying not to, but... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and cuss. I'm going to go ahead and keep it. I'm just cuss. Because I was about to cuss. But don't you dare release a video and talk about how I don't have the emotional trauma and how I can listen to white people and in the rooms what they say and that I can go listen to black people and what they say. Well, hell, Emmanuel. I've been in rooms where white folks said racism didn't exist. Hell, just the other day, some white woman uh, on Twitter uh, evoked Morgan Freeman when she said racism will stop if we just stop talking about it. Really? 
tell, tell that to the black man who's on trial with a DUI tomorrow with a white woman uh, who poured the liquor out and then said she smelled marijuana. Tell that to the people who have been killed, which we talked about with Samuel Sengawe, uh, people who have been killed by cops. Tell that to the little black girl who was trying to sell some lemonade on the side and the white woman said, I'm going to call the cops on her because she was selling some lemonade. Tell that, please, to the brothers who tried to deliver FedEx and UPS packages just because the, uh, they were black, but the white folks got to call the cops on them because something was wrong. Tell that to the black man who had shots fired at him in Mississippi trying to deliver a package. Please, by all means, tell that to Walter Scott who was shot and killed mm. by a cop while he was running away. They tell that to please Kadarius, the brother who was run over by a cop in Mississippi. Please tell that to the police departments right now that are being looked at by the Department of Justice for the vicious beating of black people. Come on, bruh. No. What you tried to do is let me just take out race and let me just take out gender. Well, that's the last thing you can actually do in a country where the original sin is race and where it was meant for women never to vote, never to own land, and their only job was to lay down and birth babies and cook in the mm. kitchen barefoot. And that's mm. who they hired. See, when you, when you decide, Emmanuel, when you decide to sit here and say, oh, oh no, you're the villain. Really? That's not the villain. That's called somebody saying, I'm leading my team to victory. That's called somebody saying, I'm going to give it as good as I get it. Because, see, what's interesting is if I put Angel Reed side by side with Caitlin Clark, Caitlin, Caitlin Clark talked mad shit. You know what? I'm not bothered by that. Because do you know who was one of, one of the biggest trash talkers in NBA history? That white boy Larry Bird. And let Burke back his shit up. You know you bad when you walk out to the NBA three-point contest with your shooting jacket on and you don't even take it off and you win the contest. Matter of fact, Larry Bird was so bad when, they, when the coach put a black player on him, he said, this is some disrespectful shit. No, I'm sorry, when we put a white player, he said, he, he told the coach, this is disrespectful as hell. You putting a white boy, a white boy can't guard me. Yeah. That was Larry Bird. Michael Jordan talked a lot of trash too. But see, I'm saying all of that because Caitlyn talked trash. Caitlyn was cussing on the court during the tournament. Her dad told her, shut the hell up and play. But you want to assign villain to the black girl. Just yeah, like the white writers assign thugs to South Carolina. Just exactly. like the LA Times writer did the exact same thing. Because exactly. the reality is, folk white sports writers, and let's be honest, if you want to be honest, Emmanuel, you saw the LSU-Iowa contest the same way folks saw Duke versus UNLV. Of course. The same way they saw Notre Dame versus Miami, the convicts Absolutely. versus the Catholics. Absolutely. The reality is that's black versus white. We know exactly Absolutely. what that is. And so, Absolutely. brother, brother, why don't you actually spend a little more time with brothers and <laughs> sisters? Because the reality is, if your ass can't even understand the generational trauma that exists in your homeland, you damn sure have mm. no clue, no concept of the reality that exists in sports in the United States of their America. Hmm. So I know you feel so blessed with the respectful private phone calls you got. <laughs> I ain't got your number. I ain't never met you. But here's what I do know. You went to that little school in Austin. At a and we call it small U, small T. You a University of Texas graduate, I'm a Texas A&M graduate. But I'm gonna end with this. You had so much to say about Angel Reese, but you ain't had a damn thing to say about the 60 people fired at the University of Texas 
uh, when it came to D D E D uh, D E I. So why don't you, Emmanuel Acho, have the courage of Emmett Smith, who stood up and spoke out against what happened at Florida, and called it like he saw it? Or maybe, just maybe, you just gonna stay quiet because you, Emmanuel Acho, you don't have that pain, and you don't have that experience because you are so blessed to be able to sit among the whites and listen to them talk without them noticing your skin. They do because they notice your parents' skin and your grandparents and the other folk in the tribe where you came from and your homeland. Bruh, you are not one of them and they will remind your ass of that, trust me, go ask Candace Owens, who got her Negro wake. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. He stoked racial violence, attacked voting rights, and if reelected, vowed to be a dictator and, quote, get revenge. We can't go back. As president, I put money in pockets creating millions of new jobs, and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it together. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. You've heard me talk on many occasions the reality of white voters in this country, how broke white folks are fully supportive of Donald Trump. It really makes no sense whatsoever. And yesterday, the topic came up on MSNBC, where former host Chris Matthews raised the issue when they were talking about how these white folks, especially the evangelicals, the evangelicals, are treating Donald Trump like he is God. Watch this. When I was up there in New Hampshire, my 10th primary up there, I saw a lot of really poor people waiting in line for two hours to see Donald Trump. Really poor people, white people in most cases. Mm. And I said, what's going on here? And I don't know if these are the cross tabs relate or why it relates, but they really want this guy to be their president again. And then I saw the F Florida Atlantic University poll that came out in March. And it pointed out that all, the only economic group in the country that likes Trump is under 50,000 a year. Not 50 to 100, not above 100, only been people below 50,000. I can't put it all together. But as oh. maybe people are hard up, people have a, a grievance against society because th society has been tough on them. White, Hispanic, uh, black, all kinds of people below 50,000 a year are for Trump. Somebody's got to get that into their heads so that that's what's going on here. And somebody's got to start thinking about why Trump is appealing to those people who are hard up. And people like in the White House, like Rachetti and Mike Donlin and Anita Dunn, somebody in that big, smart group of anonymous people have got to start thinking about who they're up against. Trump has been able to wire himself into people of basic needs who live out there are not rich. They're not all going to Florida to get the tax break. They're not like that crowd. Oh, that crowd really is out there, too. That crowd's going to benefit from these poor people. The people looking to get a tax break from Trump, they're going to, get, they're going to benefit from that. The people below in the econ lower economic groups, they're, they're just going to get left out. And it's so clear. So Democrats have got to get to the people they've always rooted for, the people at the bottom, the people with true grievance. They've always said we're for those people. They got to start rooting for them somehow, obviously. And that means Biden has got to start talking to them. And it's not happening yet. Mm -hmm. Trump's talking to them. As somebody once said of FDR, he, I didn't know him, but he knew me. Trump knows those people. When he was up there in, in New Hampshire, I heard him say something. My people have figured out that I should come to this area, Laconia, because there's a lot of poor people. And he said, it's the right. way he did. Remember, remember back in 2016 when he beat Hillary, he went to Erie and he went to Wilkesboro, the Luzerne County. He knew where his Hillary was stuck down in Philly. He knew where he was going. I think people like David Urban, who was running his campaign last time, they know where to advance him. They're going to go out there and advance him to the right places. And I tell you, it's, it's fast. I don't know if the Democrats have really thought through this campaign and what they're up against. This guy's calling himself God. God. Yeah. Now, sound not how strange God is. Yeah. And if he can get away with that, then he is truly a cult. And people got to be taught, I mean, thought through it with them. Somebody's got to start talking to people and saying to them, this guy is not for real as a secular leader. He's not Jesus. Now, 
On another day, they had a similar conversation and Matthew said this. First white people in the world. I mean, they're on their rags on their, on their backs. They look like East Germans coming out of the East Berlin back in the 80s. Uh, they, they were waiting for Trump for two hours and they believe everything he says. And they had this notion that you know, the family, the flag, uh, the country, this really big primitive notion of, of what they care about, the religion, everything. He's tying into that. He's saying, I'm your, I'm your, I'm your savior. I'm taking the bullet for you. So, allow me to unpack. Um, what the conversation failed to do was to really unpack that and, and walk through that and get people to understand really what's at play, okay? So Chris Matthews says that, what is it about these 50,000 and under? Who does Trump lose in the biggest? college educated people. What's his group? Non-college educated people. So he's purposely playing on people who are not as smart as others. Now, let me be perfectly clear, I'm not saying all those with college degrees are smarter than those without, but it's also discerning the lies from the truth. And so what Donald Trump does very well is he lies. He paints this broad picture he says, oh, I'm fighting for you, I'm standing with you. But all of those broke white folks Chris Matthews is talking about, they couldn't even walk through the lobby of one of his hotels. But see, he presents this whole notion of the plane, the excess, and so they're like, I could have that life. I could have that life. But you can't. You can't have that life. <clears throat> and you're not going to have that life. Because he says this one thing, but he does something else. So he, his fight against China, tariffs. Oh, I'm making them pay. Now tariffs works. You actually pay more. In fact, he's saying reelect me and I'm gonna impose more tariffs on China. And you, you know what's then is going to happen? What's then going to happen is it's going to cost more people more for Americans to buy goods. Those are facts. Now, those folks who are believing that, they don't understand that. They look at you like you're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? It's not going to cost me more money. Because Trump said it's going to save us money. They believe the lie. And so he feasts on that. He feasts on ignorance. And he weaponizes ignorance. So when you look at his tax cut, his tax cut did not help any of those broke white people or the broke Latinos or the broke black folks who are listening to Donald Trump. It didn't, because they're not in that income bracket. He bragged in front of a bunch of rich people at Mar-a-Lago. 
I made y'all a lot of money, and I'm going to do it again. Because that's who he cares about. So the Republican Party has created this notion that we're for the little man. Really? So how can you be for the little man, but you oppose a living wage? How can you be for the, li- how can you be for the little man when you oppose Medicaid expansion? How can you be for the little man when Republicans are passing laws in Florida and Texas preventing cities from passing laws requiring uh, businesses to provide water and water breaks for people who work outdoors. Now, what Chris Matthews is correct is Biden-Harris, they've got to speak to those voters. Last three years, Reverend William Barber has been trying to get a meeting with President Biden, not by himself. But Barbara always says in the Poor People's Campaign, they always put up affected workers. The Biden White House has been unwilling to actually do that. He says, no, the president needs to hear from affected workers, poor workers. They don't want to hear from that. The fact is, poor to low income workers are a huge voting block that has not been tapped. Chris is right, Democrats haven't reached him. But Chris said, Trump is focused on the family flag and country. Trump's family flag and country in 2024 is no different than what Howard Dean said about Republicans in 2004 when he said, God gays guns. So God gays guns, God's still the same but Trump now presents himself as the Messiah. The gay part in 2004 is now transgender. The gun part ain't changed. He's playing to a fictionalized view of what America used to be. You know what I'm talking about. You're watching a movie and they're talking about the American dream. And you see people on the big screen, they're smiling and they're talking about the nice home and the suburbs and a, or a white picket fence and where mom is at home and the kids come home from school and she's got an apron on and she's got baked cookies for them and then daddy pulls up from home with his briefcase and he kisses mommy and hugs the kids and grabs the paper and then begins to ask them how their day was. That is literally the world that Donald Trump presents. And for a lot of white people, that was America. But in that same time, black folks were getting their heads split open. Houses were being bombed. Jim Crow was running rampant. And so what you have is you have a set of people who are pining for another America. That America that we used to be. The America where we used to go to church as a family, the America where it was man and woman and not these gay people and these trans people. America where we stood for the flag and we sang proudly uh, the national anthem. That, that's really what he's doing. But these people are not paying any attention to actually what he's saying. They are paying no attention to the massive lies. They're paying no attention to the craziness that's literally coming out of his mouth. They're paying no attention to his economic policies and how they did not and will not help any of these people. They're not. So they're sitting here thinking, that's my God, that's my God. Which is why I keep trying to tell black folks, we can't sit this thing out. The reason I'm saying that to black folks, the reason we can't sit it out is because these people are mesmerized by Trump. But see, where Morning Joe didn't want to go, they didn't want to deal with the issue of race. I lay this thing out in my book, White Fear. I lay it out. Don't forget, President Lyndon Johnson called it as well. Remember this quote? He said, if you can convince the lowest white man, he's better than the best colored man. 
he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. That's what is going on. Oh, these things are happening for our very eyes. And what people don't want to deal with, they don't deal with the reality that Donald Trump is speaking a very explicit language of race. Yeah. What he's talking about is, oh, how the demonizing the immigrants and they're the reason. It's them that's causing these problems. How dare they? He's already said, I'm sending everybody back on day one. And these poor white people are like, yeah, that's it. That's it. Because they got our jobs. They're taking our jobs. But he's also doing this. This is from Axios. Exclusive. Trump allies plot anti-racism protections for white people. Hmm. If Donald Trump returns to the White House, close allies want to dramatically change the government's interpretation of civil rights era laws to focus on anti-white racism rather than discrimination against people of color. Trump's Department of Justice will push to eliminate or upend programs in government in corporate America that are designed to counter racism that is favored whites. Targets would range from decades old policies aimed at giving minorities economic opportunities to more recent programs that began in response to the pandemic and the killing of George Floyd. Hmm. Did I not tell you that was coming? Did I not warn you that this is what they were planning all along? But you have to understand when you're talking about those poor white Americans, when you're talking about why are they so aggrieved? Remember, they were there in 2016. They were there in 2020. And their grievances were there because they even see black folks problem. So how do you think the anti-CRT took hold? What do you think is the reason behind right now? anti-DEI. What do you think? We could go on and on and on. This is all a part, folks, of the same situation. Now, here's what you got to remember. Pew did a study, and 13% of whites who think they suffer a lot of discrimination. Thirteen percent. Now, let me set this up for you. So this is the graphic right here. Large majorities see at least some discrimination against many groups in our society. Muslims, Jews, Arab people, black people, Hispanics, Asian people, evangelical Christians. Those last two right there, those are Trump voters. So when Trump is attacking migrants, when he's attacking DEI, when he's attacking things like that, keep in mind, it's Stephen Miller, who was a top Trump aide, who sued to block the money to the black farmers, who's suing other folks as well. This is also about race. It's about race. It's about how can you reach that individual, reach that poor white person and get them to buy into your vision and get them to see that you are the one who could change this. You are the one who can be the difference. So therefore elect you and oh, that demon, that demon Joe Biden, that demon Kamala Harris. Oh no, those people, they are the reasons. They are the ones, they are the fundamental problem. So therefore, it must be me. 
But see, this is where Morning Joe also completely missed the mark because they did not talk about history. They did not talk about in the history of America every period of, of every period where you've had black success has been followed by white backlash. They didn't talk about that. They didn't talk about what we keep seeing happening in this country when it comes to uh, whites and how they respond. But see, a lot of people don't realize is that you can take this thing all the way back to post-slavery. You can take it all the way back to when plantation owners, they were the ones who said, whoa, 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 hold up. We, we can't have these poor white people and these freed slaves of African descent joining together. Mm-hmm. This is what MLK said in his book, excuse me, in his speech after the Selma to Montgomery March. He said, our whole campaign in Alabama has been centered around the right to vote and focusing the attention of the nation and the world today on the flagrant denial of the right to vote. We're exposing the very origin, the root cause of racial segregation in the Southland. Racial segregation as a way of life did not come about as a natural result of hatred between the races immediately after the Civil War. There were no laws segregating the races then. And as the noted historian C. Van Woodward in his book, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, clearly points out, the segregation of the races was really a political stratagem employed by the emerging bourbon interest in the South to keep the Southern masses divided and Southern labor the cheapest in the land. Y'all see right there? Southern labor the cheapest in the land. You see, it was a simple thing to keep the poor white masses working for near starvation wages in the years that followed the Civil War. Why? If, if the poor white plantation or mill worker became dissatisfied with his low wages, the plantation or mill owner would merely threaten to fire him and hire former Negro slaves and pay him even less. Thus, the Southern wage level was kept him almost unbearably low. Now, let me stop right there. You have poor whites, family, family flag country. Trump's my guy. But he opposes unions. He opposes living wages. Now, I need to, now that's, I'm sorry, that's, wait a minute. Y'all broke. So let me just be real clear, okay? You're broke. You got awful health care. You got awful education. So you're supportive of the people who want to gut public education with vouchers. And those are actual scam programs. They're not meant to help the least of, the, uh, of all those. They're meant to help folk who are already sending their kids to private school who, or who have the means to but need several more thousand dollars to get it done. They're posing health care. Trump wants to kill the Affordable Care Act. So if you, you poor and white, What's the one law that has actually helped your health care? The Affordable Care Act. And then wages. Hmm. So, King says this. Toward the end of the Reconstruction era, something very significant happened. This is what was known as the populist movement. The leaders of this movement began awakening the poor white masses and the former Negro slaves to the fact that they were being fleeced by the emerging bourbon interest. Not only that, but they began uniting the Negro and white masses into a voting bloc that threatened to drive the bourbon interest from the command post of political power in the South. To meet this threat, the Southern aristocracy began immediately to engineer this development of a segregated society. I want you to follow me through here because this is very important to see the roots of racism and the denial of the right to vote. Watch this. Through their control of mass media, they revised the doctrine of white supremacy. The use of mass media. The conservative ecosystem, conservative radio, Fox News, digital media. 
constant drumbeat, the anti-blackness being constantly fed to them drives this wedge. Go back. King says, they saturated the thinking of the poor white masses with it, thus clouding their minds to the real issue involved in the populist movement. Come back. So if I can keep y'all minds over here, then I can keep you from realizing you're being fleeced. So Fox News over here keeps saying, Emma, oh my God, inflation, has it gone down? It has. These are awful Biden programs. They're not. They're helping. They're not helping you. They are. So that's why you have Republicans who vote against infrastructure bill, but then take credit for the money when it comes there. That's why you have Re Republicans who vote against taking money that's actually helping to put broadband in rural communities, but then they actually take credit for it. But they're saturating the media. And so these poor whites, what do you think they're listening to? King says... They then directed the placement on the books of the South of laws that made it a crime for Negroes and whites to come together as equals at any level. And that did it. That crippled and eventually destroyed the populist movement of the 19th century. So when you hear people say Trump is a populist, Trump is a white nationalist populist. Trump's message is appealing to largely white people, white poor people. You do have some clueless Negroes who believe the nonsense, but that's who he is channeling his energy to because in the last election, 70% of those who voted were white. So when you hear me say, we gotta have black folks vote voting at least 70% of our capacity because we've got to offset where those white folks are. If you change the election, you have to drive that number down to about 68, 67. Those three points makes the difference in Georgia, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Nevada, Arizona, seven battleground states. So all of you who are watching and listening, I need you to understand that Trump's messaging, strong guy, save America, only I can do it love the flag, stand for the anthem, all about family. He's against everything that he says, but because he is a showman, because he's a circus leader, because he understands how to manipulate the minds, which is why he was reading all those Hitler books, because Hitler was a master of manipulation. These poor white folks are going, yes, 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 Trump's our guy, not realizing that they actually are going to be screwed. Remember those tariffs? When Trump was president, I'll never forget. There were white dairy farmers who filed for bankruptcy and lost their family farms because of Trump's nonsensical tariff war and one of them actually said to a writer that it was worth losing my family farm for what Trump is doing. Mike Lindell literally destroyed his multi-million dollar uh, pillow business to advance Trump's lying election deal. John Eastman has been disbarred from practicing law because he stood up with Trump talking about the election was rigged. Sidney Powell is next. Rudy Giuliani lost a massive uh, case in Georgia. He owes in excess of three plus million dollars. He actually owes way more than that for standing with the fool. So what am I telling you? These are so-called smart people who literally sacrifice their careers and their livelihoods for this fool Trump, and he will never help them out. So poor white people and confused black people and confused Latino people, let me make it clear, this man, 
doesn't give a damn about you. He doesn't like you. He doesn't respect you. And he will do nothing for you other than sell you a pipe dream and hope you run with it while he labs all the way to the bank. Joe, you first. You know, this is divide and conquer 101. It's always been this way. Um, how do you stay in charge when the people that you're in charge of have much more in common with each other than they do with you? The way that you do that is by uh, dividing and conquering, whether it was, you know, back in the day, the, the, the field Negroes and the house Negroes, or whether it was white folks of simple means, uh, along with immigrants and other people of simple means. You can let that white cat know, well, you know, you're not the richest, but hey, you know, at, at least you're white and therefore superior. Uh, our brother Ozzie Davis talked about this in, in Jungle Fever, actually. Um, and so you continue to do that. So Trump's not doing a new thing, okay? Um, he's certainly elevating it for sure, but he's not doing a new thing. It's been happening since the very, very beginning. This is why people that have nothing to do and, and very little in common with regular people continue to be in charge of states that are diverse, uh, people of modest means. Most people are people of modest means. And it amazes me to no end what anyone with any type of dependence on any form of government support or government program at all would be doing voting for Donald Trump because their stuff is going to go away. Um, and I do agree that what they seem to miss in that reporting is just the notion that this country was about race from the very beginning. That's still the issue. That's still the key issue. That's still the thing that's more threatening to white folks, particularly white folks that want to be in charge than anything. It's always been about race. And so um, and I don't necessarily expect that to change. It should be about class, right? But if it was really about class, the people that were in the same class that had connection because they had common and mutual interests would be living together, voting together, et cetera. Um, and so as long as that's not happening, the Donald Trumps of the world uh, can continue to win because they can actually look at him and, and overlook this whole mountain that represents their enlightened self-interest, what should be their enlightened self-interest. Here's what I need, I need healthcare. Here's what I need, I should unionize so that I can't just lose my job uh, after 20 years because they wanna cut me away. Here's what I need, I need for my uh, you know, elderly person in my family to be able to have healthcare, you know, et cetera, and look over that entirely, despite all the evidence to the contrary, and look towards Trump, who's not from the city, who's not, who's from the city. He's not rural, he's not any of these things. He didn't come from modest means either. There's no connection to him but this. That's all there is. So we have to stop paying attention. People have to stop paying attention to that suggestion, but it starts off by being honest about what we really have. Sure, you know, you can find a kernel of truth, I guess, in the, in, in the Chris Matthews argument about how he, the fact that Trump touch these, touches these folks. But you have to go back to the beginnings of this country and why we got mentioned in the Constitution as three-fifths of a person Mustafa, and no other group. Right. Mustafa, though, you can't run from it. You must challenge every lie. You must call him out. You must say that man is not going to do anything for you. And you have to be explicit. You must say, hey, poor white people, this man doesn't give a damn about you. And let me explain to you why. So, yeah, this, they should be doing that. Reverend Barber talks about it all the time. Democrats, the great, he's, they should be mobilizing, organizing and mobilizing those low, poor, vote, low, low income and poor voters because actually they could flip this entire election and become a blowout if they target those folks and get them to turn out by saying, I've done stuff for you and I'm gonna do more for you. And that fool won't do a damn thing for you. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, for some reason we're uh, resistant or allergic in this country to say the word poor. 
Like you listen to politicians talk and they never talk about poor folks. The middle class, the middle class, the middle class. That's what it's about. And you know, um, I grew up in Appalachia before I moved to Detroit. So folks often felt that the system um, had always failed them. They also always felt that nobody saw them. So Trump at least tells folks that he sees them. Now we know he's lying. We know that he doesn't care. We know all of the things that are untrue in that statement. But if you're not willing to acknowledge the fact that people are asking you to see them and not just see them, but also spend the respective amount of time that's necessary to understand the challenges that are happening inside of their communities. And then, as you just stated, be able to also help them to understand how you are already making investments and what the future sets of investments will look like to make sure that they can have that uh, life that they've always hoped that they would have. When Trump first won, I went back home uh, to visit my mother. And I remember I went into this meeting, listened to some people talk, um, and then afterwards, I asked them, I said, well, why did you vote for Trump? And a bunch of the folks said, because they could finally, finally become a millionaire. Now, a couple people chuckled after that, because some of the folks, you know, they never even graduated high school. Some did. Um, but when people perceive that they now have an opportunity, you have to also be able to address that perception that they have, because we know perception is a big driver. So this administration, you know, the Biden administration has actually put significant resources into communities across the country, has to do a better job of making sure folks, one, understand where they came from, but what does that change actually look like? And giving people something to hold on to, to know that if I give you my vote this time, that I will be able to, you know, build upon the change that's happening. But folks have not, not done that in a very effective way. So yes, we can talk about Trump and his lies, but you gotta also talk about how do you actually help right. everyday hardworking folks who may be lower income yep. to actually be able to see a better better way forward. Yep, Randy. Well, Trump to me, what, I mean, what is a white person's greatest currency, particularly um, a, per, a white person from modest means greatest currency. It is their whiteness. I mean, the reason why they are putting, making uh, poor decisions when it comes to logic is because they recognize, although they don't want to speak about white privilege uh, or own that it does exist, they recognize that their greatest power, their greatest currency in life is their whiteness. So if you do have a person that is saying, I'm gonna take you uh, back to the days where whiteness me means more um, than it is these days, he is God to them. He is the Jesus, he is the second coming because that is, as you say so eloquently in your book, Roland, that is what they fear the most, is this changing society. And so I also believe that what uh, the current administration needs to do is they need to talk frankly about that. While we are uncomfortable using the term poor and talking about economics, we're more afraid to talk about race and the change in demographics. And I think I would say to people, I understand that change is hard, but it's going to happen. The demographic is going to change. People are not going anywhere. Like we're not going to disappear. I don't. I, they seem to see, think that Trump is this big Superman that's going to, you know, change the world as it is, and it's not going to happen. So, what do we need to do to ensure the future for everybody? Because this man cannot take y'all to the promised land. We're not going back to, uh, you know, the 1800s. It's, it's not going to go back to, you know, we're not going to make America great again if great again means that all minorities are somehow pushed down and white people, regardless of their socioeconomics, are elevated. Um, so I, that's another, even with Dave Matthews, who's this seasoned, respected journalist, I feel like he skirts around talking about race and the power that it has on the population here because they're not looking at they're not they don't they're not a lot of people are not even paying attention to um, the actual legislation and things that have been passed and things that have happened. All they know is this man gets up and essentially says that I'm going to take us back yep. and that. You know, and that's all they care about. So we really need to address that. We got to get for real, for real and address that. And be honest, like, I know you're scared, but guess what? 
Ain't nobody in this country going anywhere. So how do we ensure that everyone from one, you know, all social economic levels can get where they are living in a way that they want to live and they have opportunities? Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media and investment. This next generation social app has already raised $10 million and has just opened a new round to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse, and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. As president, I put money in pockets and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do, but we can do it. All right, so yesterday was crazy busy. I'm sitting there in the middle of a move to another house, and, and, and man, we were busy with April 4th, uh, the 56th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And, and so folks thought were texting and calling me. Then I saw social media and all these folks were uh, talking about uh, Charlemagne the God and being on The Daily Show and him talking about DEI. And, and I was just like, OK, yeah, I've been sorry. I've been busy. So um, I, I looked at it, looked at it two or three times today. And we talked about some of these things before that he laid out in it. And so I, I want to deconstruct it because I do have some thoughts uh, about what was said. So um, we're going to take it from the top uh, and then I'm going to walk you all through this and share some things with you uh, that hopefully you can uh, be more well rounded and informed about the reality of what we're talking about with DEI. Go called diversity, equity, and inclusion are DEI. It means more fair hiring policies, new anti-discrimination rules for the workplace, and sensitivity training seminars. And the first thing it led to was a shitload of ads. Real progress on diversity and inclusion doesn't happen without real work. Say celebrate diversity into your X1 voice remote to discover curated content today. Every day. General Mills serves the world by making food people love. And inclusion is one of our secret ingredients. At Kraft Heinz, our purpose is to make life delicious. And we believe we can't achieve that without one essential ingredient, diversity. It's diversity that makes life delicious. We're on a 400 year long journey and scars don't fade, but neither does hope. Ask your doctor if black people are right for you. That's right. <laughs> Nobody's buying Vaseline because of diversity. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever actually bought Vaseline. It's just there. Like, <laughs> it comes with the house. <laughs> so that's how things stood in 2020, but that was like 15 years ago. Today, when people talk about DEI, it's more likely to sound like this. DEI is just a rebranded version of hating. Put on pause right there. All right, so... I mean, let's, let's, un, uh, let's unpack this. Now, first and foremost, uh, to understand DEI today, what you have to understand is how did you even get to DEI? So, and, and remember, 1968, a report was done. It's called, it was commonly known as the Kerner Commission Report. And the report examined the cause of the riots in 1967. And what the result of that report, they concluded, they talked about a lot of issues and they actually fought back and forth. What they said is there are two Americas, there were one white, one black. And one of the recommendations in the Kerner Commission report was that um, news media greatly contributed to the riot coverage, so therefore it needed to be diversified. So you then begin to see your first, in, your first influx of African Americans in mainstream media. It really happened after the commercial. I'm talking about in, in significant numbers after 1968. So if you look at the early 70s, you really then begin to see your first programs dealing with affirmative action. Why? Well, remember, President Lyndon Baines Johnson used that phrase first when he was at Howard University. Then Richard Nixon is elected. One of Richard Nixon's focus was in order to reach African-Americans, let's tap into economics. So what Nixon did was Nixon tapped Arthur Fletcher 
and Arthur Fletcher, many have called the father of affirmative action. Bob Brown, a rep who, was, who was a very close associate of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., involved in Operation Breadbasket. Bob Brown had a significant portfolio and was advancing a number of these economic initiatives in the Nixon administration. The reason Earl Graves was able to actually launch Black Enterprise is because he had raised money but did not have enough money and he was seeking a grant from the federal government. Bob Brown discussed this in his book. And the Nixon folks were trying to block that grant because Earl Graves had worked for Bobby Kennedy. And Bob Brown was like, the hell with that. Give him the damn loan. That's how Earl Graves was able to get the loan to launch what we now know as Black Enterprise. And so in the 1970s, you begin to see your first wave of African Americans in corporate America. Now, if you were a vice, remember, Jackie Robinson was the first vice president of a major corporation uh, in New York City. So you go into the 1970s, and so you now begin to see African Americans go into corporate America. And the problem is that many of these African Americans, the highest that they got was really vice president of community affairs. We call those the Negro jobs. Those were the jobs that where basically their job was to work with the community and they would show up at the events and they would come with the big checks with the small numbers and all stuff like that. You had that. Now, Ellis Coles talked about that generation of African Americans in the 70s and 80s in this book. Let's pull it up. The Rage of a Privileged Class. This is the book right, this is the, uh, the book right here. Uh, why are middle class blacks angry? Why should America care? And he talked about the things that they went through because they were hitting that glass ceiling. It is a phenomenal book that you actually ought to read. Once you then, and so you get those affirmative action programs. Remember, you have black mayors. So you get affirmative action programs that were quite significant in Atlanta, Maynard Jackson, Coleman Young in Detroit, Gary Hatcher in Gary, Indiana. You had Stokes in Cleveland, Marion Barry in Washington, D.C., and other places. Then what happens in 1980? Reagan is elected. So now you go into the 80s. Then you have the Supreme Court decision that then began to uh, limit affirmative action programs. Then you saw a shift from affirmative action into diversity. So what you saw in the 80s, 90s, and the 2000s, you begin to see these diversity officers, chief, chief diversity officers. Then you, you shift from diversity or chief global diversity officer to DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, because coming out of the black freedom movement, the focus was on African Americans. Then Title IX hits in 1972, which was about women. And so who is the greatest beneficiary of affirmative action? White women. So what is known today as DEI is simply the child of the initial affirmative action programs. But what they then then did, they began to expand this to not just be for African Americans. It became African Americans. It became white women. It became Latinos. Asian Americans, Native Americans, it became gay, it became disabled, and, and then all of a sudden, the critics were like, well, why can't we have diversity of thought? So what, so what was initially programs to target African Americans then began to expand, and so now that, that, that broad focus now began to get wide and all kind of other folks were included. I remember I was speaking in a corporation and somebody asked me about DEI programs and I said, black people. They were like, that's it. I said, ethics, eth I said, ethnic Americans. I said, I limited that. I wasn't trying to include everybody else because I was focused on exactly what programs were designed for. And so George Floyd is murdered May 2020. I remember talking to somebody who was in the DEI space. At one point after the death of George Floyd, there were something like 100 open DEI jobs on LinkedIn. I mean, all of a sudden, the jobs opened up. And so you then begin to see corporations posting on Instagram, on Twitter, all these places talking about their support for diversity, equity, and inclusion. It was sort of like, 
hmm, really? Really? And so you begin to see that. Then you have these commitments of billions of dollars. Stories have been done on these corporations. I, the numbers have gone, I've seen numbers anywhere from 30 billion to 100 billion talking about supporting various initiatives all across the country. Let's pull it up. Come on. Here we go. Corporate America's $50 billion promise. That's one story. I've seen other stories where it's even higher. And everything was about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, diversity, equity, inclusion. Now, once you begin to unpack DEI, once you begin to realize that 70, something like 75% of the people who had the DEI jobs were white folks. Yep, weren't black folks, it was white folks. A lot of them women. Now, press play, let's pick up where Charlemagne left off and let me unpack the next part. DEI is just a rebranded version of uh, uh, hating White people. DEI, in this case, stands for divisive, erroneous, and insidious. DEI, which stands for didn't earn it. Discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination. <laughs> DEI. DEI stands for Dr. Dre, Easy E, and Ice Cube. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all cheering out there, but do you want with attitude coming to your office? <laughs> These right wingers are crazy, right? Jesus. But here's the part where you all stop applauding everything I say. The truth about DEI is that although it's well intentioned, it's mostly garbage. Okay? It's kind of. Freeze like right the there. Freeze right there. Now, understand from day one, from day one, white folks could not stand affirmative action programs. From day one. If you go back into history, they couldn't stay in programs after the Civil War. So at every point, you've had this reluctance because it's like, oh, fine, y'all got some freedoms, but oh, no, 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 we ain't trying to give y'all no jobs. We're trying to give you any housing. And so you had the pushback against affirmative action programs. Then it became, let's get rid of these quarter programs. So. The folk that you saw, all them Fox News folks, all these anti-DEI people, Christopher Rufo, all these people, these folks have been running their mouths, and you, you throw in a sprinkle of some black people, some others in there, and they have been opposing these programs because they don't want to deal with white supremacy. They don't want to deal with racism. And see, what they then do is, this is the whole game, and you see it now. Oh, oh, because, you know, the Charlie Kirks of the world. Oh, I'm concerned if there's a black pilot. Candace Owens, all the people saying that sort of nonsense. As if we had airplane crashes by white people. See, we're not talking about a significant percentage of people who are in corporate power. We're not. It's largely controlled by White America. Those are just facts. And so critics are going to be critics. They are going to complain about any of these things because they don't want to deal with the underlying issue, which is when it comes to hiring, people pretty much hire who they know. And if all you know are white folks, and if all you see are white folks, and if all you hang out with the white folks, and if you only recruit at schools where there are white folks, and that's exactly who you're going to hire. Press play. The truth about DEI is that although it's well-intentioned, it's mostly garbage, okay? It's kind of like the Black Little Mermaid. Just because racists hate it doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> and you know I'm right, because every one of you has sat through one of those diversity training sessions and thought, this is some bullshit. <laughs> and it's not just you. Now, here's the whole deal. We talk about diversity training. I've been in various programs, and what we have to understand is people don't like to be confronted with their own issues. We love to live in our silos, how we were raised, how we were brought up, and we like to look at the world in a certain way. What we don't want to have to do is consider somebody else's perspective. I remember when I was at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, and the Maynard Institute was brought in to deal with a training program for us to diversify our sources. And I remember sitting there and there was a was a white male business writer and he was he was conservative and he was he was resisting what they were talking about. And we're sitting there going, but look at who you call. 
See, for him, he would say, and this is what you hear from white folks today, well, I, I, I'm calling the people who I think are well-versed and experts on the topic, precisely. But the people you're calling, they're nearly all white. Do you even think to call black experts? Do you even think to call black economists? And see, what well, they would then go, well, I don't understand. Why do I have to call a black economist? You don't have to, but you could call an economist who happens to be black. Because what we see when it comes to how we live and how we work is that that's what folks do. And so if you start looking at contracts, start looking at, well, who's getting these contracts? Well, if the catering company and the, and, and the, the legal fees and the um, architecture company and the engineering company and uh, all professional service, if everybody white, man, that's who getting hooked up. But y'all don't think about it. There's a, there's a black an accounting firm. There's a black law firm that could do some of the outside work. No, see, they don't think about those things. And so the reality of DEI, it is forcing people to get out of their comfort zone and say, diversify who we do business with, provide equity in terms of economics, and include other people. But people hate to have to do that because they don't want to be forced to do it because that means they have to do some work. That means they don't have to, they, they, that means they have to now go seek people. I remember Chris Rock complained about the lack of black people on Saturday Night Live. And he said, here's the problem. The white folks at SNL, they keep going to the same place, Second City in Chicago, or they're going to places in Canada. He said, y'all ain't going to the black comedy clubs. Y'all not going to hang out there. And so what he was saying is, if this is all you know, if, this, if you're at SNL, you're Lauren Michaels, and this is all you know, you don't even see all this talent over here. You don't even see all this talent over here. And that's the reality of why you have DEI programs. It's not about, oh, I'm hiring somebody who simply can't do it. But see, that's what the haters do. See, the haters love to frame this thing as, oh, they, they're not good enough. But you notice, these white folks who criticize DEI, they never ever seem to question incompetent white people because they operate from the basis that they're naturally qualified and they never assign their racial identity to them getting hired. So they'll say, well, we had to hire a black person. We had to hire a black lawyer. We had to hire that. But you hired all these white folks. What do they all have in common? That's what we're now seeing with the criticism of DEI. Push play. And it's not just you. Over 900 studies have shown that DEI programs don't make the workplace better for minorities. In fact, it can actually make things worse because of the backlash effect. OK, so this is where I have a fundamental problem with what Charlemagne said there, because this notion that, well, it makes the harder in the workplace because these people don't like it. I don't give a shit if they don't like it. I don't care. Because the fact of the matter is, it does matter. And when you listen to all of these uh, haters, they're actually lying. This, folks, is from the Pew Research Center. You see, May 17th, 2023. Workplace diversity and equity and inclusion efforts, or DEI, a majority of Americans employed, 56% say focusing on DEI at work is a good thing. Six in 10 Americans, 61%, say their company or organization has policies that ensure fairness in hiring, pay or promotion. 52% say they have trainings or meetings on DEI at work. Now, you start going through this and the folks who have been interviewed, yes, look at this here. Relatively small share of workers place a lot of importance on diversity at their workplace. Well, then half of workers say their company or organization pays about the right amount of attention to increasing DEI. Women are more likely than men to value DEI at work. Ah, there are wide partisan differences in views of workplace DEI. 78% 
of Democratic and Democratic leaning workers say focusing on DEI at work is a good thing compared with 30 percent of Republicans and Republican leaners. Now. Now you understand. What is the Republican Party? It's a white party. President Herbert, Herbert Hoover was a leader of what was called the Lily White Movement, where Republicans who came out of the radical Republicans after the Civil War aligned with the KKK to suppress black people. It was called the Lily White Movement. That's today's Republican Party. See, they hate all this DEI stuff. It's right there in the data. Only 30 percent of Republicans like it. So when you're watching Fox News and you're hearing conservative radio, all these digital sites, what you're hearing are people who are, oh, my God, this this DEI stuff is awful because it lines up with actually their point of view, because they don't actually want to see people like us actually move ahead. Press play. With Dare from school. Y'all remember Dare? Yeah. <laughs> she said, woo. D <laughs> DEI training is like dare for racism. And, and you all know how effective that was. I was sitting there going, oh shit, there's a ton of fun drugs I should try. I didn't even know about Molly. Thanks, Officer John. But the biggest failure of DEI is that the number of black people in power at big companies is basically the same as it was five years ago. In fact, maybe the only thing that DEI has accomplished is giving racist white people cover to be openly racist. Now, again, this is where Charlemagne's wrong. Here are the number of African-Americans who are now CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. There are nine. Now, first of all, I said Fortune 500 companies, so we ain't talking a huge amount. But the reality is, just five years ago, a few years ago, there were five. OK, so what you are seeing the progress now. Now, here's the issue. The problem that you see in the executive leadership council, the group of black corporate leaders, they've dealt with this, is that for many of these leaders who are black people who are in corporate America, the problem is when they get to 55, 58, they're being moved out. And so they're still hitting a ceiling. That is a fundamental problem that we are seeing. But. That means when we're talking about DEI, you're going to have to have white folks who make it a priority. I'm going to unpack that in a second. Press play. DEI breeds complacency, Dana, and complacency kills. We're going to have doctors who don't know how to perform heart surgery, and we're going to have uh, planes that are falling out of the sky. Boeing recently bragged not about being the best in the business, but about surpassing its diversity quotas. Oh, goody. But then not so good. A door flying off one of Boeing 737 Supermaxes. I'm sorry, if I see a black pilot, I'm going to be like, boy, I hope he's qualified. I mean, honestly, when I see a black pilot, I'm not worried that we're going to crash. I'm worried that we're going to get pulled over. <laughs> okay? That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and no, officer, I will not step out of this vehicle. All right? <laughs> But yeah, they're blaming DEI for everything. Even that bridge in Baltimore. They called Baltimore's mayor the DEI mayor, like he was given the job for being black. Then they said the shipping company was too focused on DEI instead of safety. But almost the entire leadership of the company is white. <laughs> no black people, right? If anything, the Baltimore mayor he should have been the one to make it racist. Just come out like, these crackers knocked down my bridge. Okay? All right? And one of y'all crackers better pay for it. Okay? And honestly, uh, I'm not surprised these programs didn't work. And here's why. It's just corporate PR. They want good vibes. And also, they want to cover their ass. Okay? <laughs> Did you know that if a company gets sued for civil rights violations, just having a DEI program will be counted as evidence in their favor, even if the program doesn't do shit, okay? It's the I have a black friend of the legal system, <laughs> all right? We don't need corporate DEI. Yes, we want diversity and equity and inclusion, but we don't want it from Vaseline. <laughs> Although I'm not going to front, Vaseline has been there for the black community. Respect, okay? All right? That's right. I'm moisturized. Okay? 
Look, man, uh, real DEI is only going to come from black leadership. I don't know how to do it because I'm not a black leader, but I do know how to tell if it's working. Just keep an eye on right wing media. The more they're freaking out, the more progress we're making. OK, um, this is where Charlemagne is flat out wrong. So when he says that we don't need DEI from corporate America, it's not true. And he says it's going to come from black people. Here's the problem with that. Put the graphic back up. There are only nine black CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. That means that there are 491 non-black CEOs of Fortune 500 company. The reality is you are going to need white people who actually believe in diversity, equity, inclusion for that to happen. And there are examples. Al Newharth, he was the founder of USA Today. Al Newharth grew up in South Dakota. He did not grow up around a lot of black people. But Al Newharth understood the value of diversity. So when Al Newharth was the CEO of Gannett, he made a declaration that Gannett was going to be the leading company, the leading company in America when it came to the issue of diversity. I had a syndicated column with Creator Syndicate. And when Al Newharth died in, 1980, in 1989, uh, this here is exactly what I wrote. Quote, his obituary in the New York Times read, in an industry long dominated by white men, Mr. Newhart led the way in the hiring and promotion of women and minorities, tying compensation to hiring goals. By 1988, the proportion of minorities in Gannett newsrooms was 47% higher than the national average. Women accounted for nearly 40% of the company's managers, professionals, technicians, and sales agents, and an unheard of quarter of its newspaper publishers. In Al Newhart's book, Confession of an SOB, he actually wrote that when he launched this particular initiative, that people were angry, folks were upset with him. And he said, point blank, if any of y'all have a problem with me tying your bonuses to your diversity numbers, you are free to leave the company. And guess what? A lot did. But you know what happened? You saw an explosion of black people, Hispanics, white women and others who became publishers, news directors, managing editors, general managers of media company. And guess what that guess what that did? That forced all the other media companies to go, damn, we about to lose our minority talent. So we now got to change our programs. So guess what happened? Knight Ritter, Cox and the others begin to change. The problem is we didn't have enough Al Newharts in media to change the industry. He was by himself. As another example, John Landgraf. John Landgraf is the, was CEO, is the CEO of FX, the cable network. Now, you've seen many of those programs. You've seen Donald Glover's show, uh, uh, Atlanta shows along those lines. Well, guess what? John Landgraf uh, sat there and looked at his shows. And he then began to say, wait a minute, we got a problem. It's too many white guys. It's too many white directors. It's too many white showrunners. It's too many white writers. We can't tell different stories by keep hiring white folks. He was quoted saying, listen, I like my white guys. This is not going to work. So in 2016, John Landgraf sent out an email to his entire network and said, this has to change. In 2021, check this out. Nearly half of all episodes on FX were directed by people of color. Women were 35% of those uh, who directed those episodes. But it wasn't just directors. And listen to this, quote, truthfully, I'm not proud of, proud of fact it took me so long to take concerted action on inclusiveness. He said, hold on one second. He said, because um, he had been running the network at that time for 15 years. It's heartening to see our industry fully commit to meaningful, measurable, measurable and permanent change. He said, when FX was radically over-indexing in one race and gender, we were by definition overlooking talent. When we started looking for talent in every segment of our population, our shows got better. When you're in the talent business, diversity is good for business. Now, that's why Charlemagne is wrong. The reality is black folks ain't running these joints. We're not running these companies. Now, we may push folks. You may have a few folks in there, 
But you need operational leaders. Jonathan Rogers, who was the uh, first CEO of TV One. When Jonathan Rogers joined the board of Comcast, I was like, yo, that's awesome. He's like, eh, not really. I was like, hold up. Now, y'all, Jonathan was on the board of Procter & Gamble. He was on the board of Nike. And I was like, Jonathan, are you serious? He said, I didn't want a board job. He said, Roland, I want an operational job. I was like, but is it a board job? Better than an operational job? He said, no. I said, Jonathan, why? He said, because if I had an operational job, that's where you hire. He said, by the time it gets to the board, we don't control hiring. He said, we just sit here and oversee the CEO. That was an instructive thing he actually said to me. So what we have to understand is that for DEI to work, you've got to actually have individuals who are in power, for the most part, they're gonna be white, who are making the decisions in order to be able to affect the change. This is where we, this is where we, again, make a mistake on this very issue. And so Mark Cuban, he's been very much talking about a lot of these issues. He's been focusing on a lot of these issues. And so I sent Mark Cuban, don't, don't pull it up yet. I sent Mark Cuban an email to get his particular thoughts. And I wanted to get him on the show uh, because he's been going back and forth against Christopher Rufo, against Elon Musk, slamming them on this issue uh, of diversity. I mean, he, he's, he's been swinging on them. And so I sent, I sent Mark an email and I said, hey, we'd love to have you on the show, but if you can't come on the show, uh, share with me some thoughts. And so this is, well, this is the email that Mark Cuban, of course, who, uh, of course, the owner of the Mavericks, well, he sold the team, but this is what he sent me back. He said, Roland, he said, look at the top 10 market cap companies. All have DEI programs, even Tesla. Three of the top four are run by people of color. The other, Apple, by a gay man. All make DEI a priority. My general position is that I believe DEI is really good for business. People trust people who look like them. They want to do business with them. But to me, it's not about hiring heads of DEI and creating a bureaucracy or doing commercials like Charlamagne CTG criticized. It's about following good DEI business principles. Diversity is looking for great people where others don't. There are a lot of smart people that, ignored for, that are ignored for jobs. Find them where others aren't looking. E equity is where the right goes nuts. They think it's about quotas and making sure no one has an advantage or can succeed beyond anyone else. Equity is putting your employees in a position to succeed. That's it. Training, support, etc. If you hire someone smart, no matter what they look like, give them the tools to make you more successful. Inclusion, make people feel good about themselves at work. That's just smart business. He is right. We need more black leaders. But when you are only 8% of the white collar workforce, it takes time. And he contradicted himself. Can racists freak out any more than they are now? Everything is about DEI, which is another way of saying people of color aren't qualified. They can't do the job. They only get it because of DEI. Look at the people that work for you. Where do you recruit? How do you put your employees in a position to succeed? How do you make people who are different feel included? You have been an entrepreneur for a long time. Talk about your business and your experience. You don't have to have a DEI program to practice DEI. You just have to run your business the right way and set standards for how people are treated. And folks right there, the fundamental issue with DEI programs as to how they are set up right now is that they are performative because the leaders are not serious. The leaders are not taking proactive decisions. The leaders are not, are not sitting here going, wait a minute, who has all of our legal, our outside legal work and our accounting work? We're spending money on catering. Do we have any black caterers? We spend how much money on flowers for the office? Are we using any black florists? We spend money on audiovisual. Are we using any black audiovisual companies? How much of our money is going to spend on advertising? Oh, the ad agency we're using, are they diverse? Oh, we're not going to spend our money with lily white ad agencies. Oh, y'all see how that works? 
That's what a leader does. So you can't have white folks over here talking about pull yourself up by your bootstrap, why y'all can't get ahead, uh, why you're always begging the government for money. But then over here, we're frozen out of jobs, we're frozen out of contracts, and frozen out of opportunities, and then you complain about DEI. So what I need folks to understand, and again, it was a comedy segment, and it was five and a half minutes. I've already gone 38 minutes. But the reality, when we talk about what's happening with DEI, these white racists and these haters, they are trying to attack everything that is positioning black people where we are today. They're suing the Fearless Fund. They're targeting every program in corporate America. They're targeting law firms. You name it, that's what they're doing. Because of this, and I wrote about it, and y'all, everything you're seeing I called, is white fear. They now have to compete. And so what they don't like is, wait a minute, y'all now recruiting at HBCUs? Oh, no, 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 they're not smart enough. See, they couldn't get into our schools, so therefore they had to go to those schools. Oh, yeah, you, they, oh, no, you see, uh, so you see what happens when they, when they come out of these high schools and they come to our schools and they're on academic probation the first or second year? But those same people don't want to confront the economic inequality at those high schools, then those junior highs, then the elementary schools. Oh, then you don't want to confront the economic inequality that's happening in those neighborhoods. Oh, then you don't want to confront the economic inequality that those parents went through. Damn, then you don't want to confront the economic inequality that those grandparents went through. See, it's real easy to act like we're all running from the same mark and running a race when you all know that's not the case. And so the attacks on DEI, they are absolutely anti-blackness. The problem with corporate America is that there are too many white folks in corporate America who are playing games when it comes to DEI. They're handing out DEI jobs and the people have no budgets. They got no P and L responsibility. And the leadership of the companies, it's not a priority. In order for DEI to truly be effective in America, we're gonna need a thousand Al Newharts. And we're gonna need a thousand John Landgrafs. We're gonna need white executives, white men, white women to actually be honest about their failures when it comes to leading. That was what has to happen. So if folks are, if you're breaking down this segment and you are, oh my goodness, what went on here? This is the whole deal. To corporate America, stop being performative. That's why we in the Black Owned Media Collective, that's why we challenge General Motors. That's why we challenge McDonald's. That's why we challenge these companies. And you know what happened? Target was like, oh, we're going to spend $2 billion on black companies. All of a sudden, Group M announced 30 or 40 of their companies, some named a lot not. They're going to spend at least 2% of their ad budgets with black, with black Owned Media. We're still waiting because we haven't gotten any money from Group M here at the Black Star Network. And I've been meeting with them for a very long time, three years. We've gotten zero. I've been meeting with publicists for the past several weeks because we got the runaround from publicists for three years. And we're finally meeting with chief investment officers. I, got, I met with OMD after getting the runaround, met last year, a CIO left, so now we're trying to meet with their chief investment officer. There are other ad agencies we're trying to reach as well. So here's the deal. You can't tell black people, well, you're not building your business. Well, I can't get the contract. Well, you need access to capital. Well, no, I ain't got no debt. I can look right now. I got, a, I got money in the bank, so I need a contracts. I can't grow my business. I can't hire more people if I don't have the contracts. See, if we talk about the reality of DEI, nothing is going to change as long as you have scared, timid, weak, impotent, white corporate leaders who are unwilling to look their friends, their country club pals, and their family members in the eye and say, a lot of the shit that comes out of your mouth is racist. And the fact of the matter is, America and these companies are not gonna be able to grow if we are, do not have 
diverse initiatives. Last point, Charlemagne said, well, he, I want the album comes to Vaseline. Unilever owns them. Unilever owns a ton of companies. Unilever owns a ton of companies where we as black folks buy products. Oh, hell yes, Unilever had better have a strong ass DEI program. And Unilever and Clorox and Procter & Gamble and Apple and all of these companies need to be spending money with black owned media, need to be spending money with black law firms, need to be spending money with black accounting firms, need to be spending money with black engineering firms, need to be spending money with African Americans up and down their business diversity list, not supplier diversity, business diversity. What we're seeing with the attacks of DEI are from, frankly, scared white people who don't want to confront systemic racism in corporate America. But this is a moment when white leadership, while you have these lawsuits going on, has to have the courage to say, we aren't going anywhere. We're going to do what Al Newharth did. And that's say, if you don't like the fact that we support diversity, equity, inclusion, you, white critic, are more than happy to leave. Because I bet you we're going to be successful in finding your replacement and they likely will be black or person of color. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. This is a fundamental problem. We organized, we were invited in by the students uh, to have the news conference today. And I said, we're going to do the broadcast from here. Because when you own it, you can make those calls. Brother came up to me today and said to me, he said, I want to let you know at the NAACP, we're here, but we, can't, we cannot wear our paraphernalia. And I said, why? He said to me at the state conference of the NAACP, sent them a note saying that because they did not get approval for this protest, they could not wear any NAACP gear. I said, well, first, this is not a protest. It's a news conference. And he, and he showed me the text message. Now, I'm on a text thread where Derek Johnson, the CEO, is on it. And I put on there, I'm flabbergasted by that decision. And see, that to me, that to me right there, Jeff, is a problem. It's a, it's a problem when, if we, if we are standing in the state capitol, fighting, again, I'm, I'm from Houston, okay? I, I fight for Texas Southern for Prairie View. Listen, I'm a Texas A&M graduate. I've called them out. I've blasted them. But this is a perfect example for me of weak leadership, of, of impotent leadership. That... What the message should have been is flood members there. Wear your shirts. Wear your hats. If you have students at Tennessee State and we're talking about fighting for them, then I need the Alpha president, the AKA president, the Delta president, the Iota, the Sigma, uh, Omega, Kappa, uh, Zeta, all of them saying we going to stand without chapters on those campuses. I, I'm not interested in seeing all the photos and the videos of who just crossed line. If you ain't saying nothing about the money, where is the Nashville Urban League? So, again, I say it on the show all the time, 
If you represent black people, which black people do you represent? Go ahead. I told y'all I own it, so I don't care. My brother, in like fashion, there's a language that we speak that some people cannot understand. Since I left Tennessee State University at 22 years old, I ran a newspaper called The Third Eye for 11 years. I ran a theater company on Clifton Avenue called the Amon Ra Theater for 11 years. I have, a, the I have a, a space called the Infinity Fellowship right now, 10 years in. There's never been a time in my adult life when I did not sign the front of the check. So it's different when you own stuff. Yep. Because then people can't tell you what to do. The issue in Nashville is the issue that is in very many other cities, as my brother elucidated. He's, he's great. The petty bourgeoisie. We have an issue. In this city, again, since I'm not employed by anybody, I don't have a revenue stream, I don't have hundreds of thousands of, of, of dollars coming in from outside sources and foundations and everything to pay me to say this kind of thing, I'm going to say it very clearly. Too many people in this city have been manipulated by small special interests whose job it is to create a city that disenfranchises the poor and black folk in favor of business and growth. Across the street from this church, Jefferson Street, Meharry, 20, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you could get a 50 by 150 lot for about $6,000 maybe $1,200 if you were lucky. That same 50 by 150 lot is now $350,000. Behind Tennessee State, the place called College Hill, when we knew we were hurting as campus students, the NAACP, which is two doors down, showed up for us in full gear. Michael Grant was the president at the time. The Interdenominational Ministerial Fellowship, which at the time was the most powerful organization of ministers in town, Reverend Kelly Miller Smith, a junior, uh, Reverend Wallace Charles Smith, all of these people came out and said, don't touch these kids. And they stood behind us. They didn't lead us. And that becomes a difference. They did not lead us. They said, what do you want us to do? Right. Which is the way it should be. It's called, be. we're here to help. We need we're here help. to have your back. And we have your back. Because when you move into a space of elderhood, you're there for the young people. When they make a move, you follow them. In the absence of that, if the students are not in a space where they speak up, we have to be careful in this city because there are people who will take the opportunity to grab this camera lens and this light to promote their own agenda, and much of the time it is tied to those special interests who are making the donations to the campaigns. I have seen people on council go from, we will not stand to the developer, to looking in their account and seeing $200,000 from the people they said they would stand about, and everybody got quiet as our neighborhoods disappeared. How does this tie to the leadership at Tennessee State and how we move forward? Because many people who come into this space who are taught that the pursuit of capitalist ideals is the ideal when they come in and they have potential and talent. When they have this fearlessness, somebody comes in and says, let me introduce you to the right people in the room. And instead of doing the right thing, they're convinced that they're doing the best they can. So when it's time for the cameras to come on, they show up right. and they talk and they're there. But when it's time to do the day-to-day -day work, many of these students out here, I counsel personally, spiritually, as a spiritual leader. And they come in and they're crying and they're hurting because they say nobody listens to us. And every time we try to tell our story, somebody from some random organization that we don't know about pops up and grabs a mic and won't even listen to us. We have got to get this balance in. That's why I'm grateful for you for coming to this city because there are things that you can eliminate, illuminate, that other people in this city are too afraid to illuminate because their hand is in the bag. I'm not saying this from a judgmental space. Listen, I, 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 my wife and I got five kids. I got two adults, one adult in about two days. They're sitting in the back row back there. Three of my kids are in this space today, so I want them to hear this. Because one thing, it's owners rolling. One thing that my, I can say my kids have never seen me do, they've never seen me be one person when I'm in these places right. and somebody else when I get home. And a lot of our young people growing up are seeing that. 
when they go home. So they're learning to play a game. Right. So this transparency as it comes to the university is what are we, this generation, willing to sacrifice to make sure that the next generation can be here? And some of that falls on externally and some of it falls internally. Right. The board had an opportunity, if I can talk real, to say let go of three people. The deal is you let go of three people, we're going to keep five in place. Now, as an owner and as a person who advises nonprofits professionally, that's real simple math to me. You line up eight people and you say, who's brought in the most resources? Let's rank them Boom. one through eight. The bottom Boom. three, write the letter in 15 minutes. There you go. And let's keep control of the school. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million and now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits. As bad as Trump was, his economy was worse and black America felt it the most. He cut health insurance while giving tax breaks to the wealthy and big business. As president, I put money in pockets and capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. There's a lot more to do. But we can do it.